Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of John Ocrafa. I am Noel. Joining me for this project is JD. Mr. Pat Sajak, I tell you, he really does it for me. <laughs> oh, God, that line, yeah. Uh, there were some weird zingers in this script. Yep. We're doing a project covering some of the ephemeral Halloween-related stuff, especially going through some of the unproduced screenplays. We have another one of those today. This is the episode where we are covering Halloween 666, The Origin. Dun, dun, dun. That's a title. Man, that was such a common thing for like, you know, Children of the Corn, 666, Isaac's Return. This was the first of the Halloween sequels to drop its numbering two when they did Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers. They dropped the six. Yeah. Gee, I wonder why horror movies would want to use 666 whenever they reach their sixth installment. Yeah, it's a cliche. Before we get to this script, I just wanted to ask you, J.D., have you seen the actual Halloween 6 that they made, and what did you think of it? I did. I think I remember I liked it more than what you and Alex did when you discussed that film. Do you remember which cut you watched? I watched the theatrical. Okay. I know I did. I've seen mm -hmm. bits and clips of the cut material, but I haven't seen all of it. It's not a great film. It's definitely one of the worst of that middle trilogy, but I didn't hate it. It's a fine film, though. It's kind of forgettable other than Baby Paul Rudd. Hmm. Who, I'll point out, I did still have in my head when I was reading Tommy in this script. For whatever reason, I just have him ingrained as Tommy. I didn't in Halloween 4, but I did in this one. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it was made to be around the same time that yeah, Paul yeah. Rudd could have been in this role. Everyone who wants to listen who hasn't, we did do a, a Masters of Carpentry episode on Halloween Curse of Michael Myers, which you can all go and listen to. From what I remember, me and Alex, we really did not like the producer's cut. It was just kind of a muddled, fanfic -y mess. And the theatrical cut, we at least found more entertaining. It was stupider, especially the whole third act that they replaced. We thought that third act at least had a good energy to it mm -hmm. and some good slick moments. But yeah, not a fan of Halloween. I actually still think Five is a worse movie. I barely remember Five, to yeah. be honest. Yeah, it's basically just drunk Donald Pleasant screaming in a child's face and POV shots. Well, what else do you need in a film? Exactly. <laughs> That would make a fun, like, grindhouse horror comedy. Drunk Donald Pleasance. It's like Hobo with a shotgun. Evil! Evil! Donald Pleasance with a whiskey. You'll die! Everyone will die! He causes everyone to die! <laughs> <laughs> oh, bless you, Donald Pleasance. Oh. Uh. This script, written by Phil Rosenberg, I really don't have any information on Phil Rosenberg. There's several Phil Rosenbergs who have worked as writers in Hollywood. Probably the most prominent is a guy who wrote a bunch of cop shows and TV movies. I don't think it's that guy. There's another Phil Rosenberg that started writing like for TV in the early 2000s. I know around this time, there was the rise of the screenwriter Scott Rosenberg, who would go on to write like Things to Do in Denver When You're Dead, Con Air, Gone in 60 Seconds, Beautiful Girls. And I know he has a brother named Phil Rosenberg who has like a story credit with him on a couple of projects. I don't know if that's related. Yeah. I don't know if this is a pseudonym. I don't know if this is someone who just, this was his one shot at the industry and it never happened and he just went on with his life. When this script surfaced, I want to say early this year, I think it was around January this year when this script first appeared, there's a whole lot of mystery. A lot of people were like, we never even knew about this. And there's no backstory on it at all. Mm. All I can see is that it's dated April 6, 1994, and Halloween Curse of Michael Myers actually came out September 29th, 1995. So that would have been about a year and a half later. Granted, you know, slasher films, they don't take that long to make, but, you know, that was a film where they filmed it, and then they had to go and film part of it again. I did have a couple of Dennis Veron screenplays for Halloween Curse of Michael Myers, but none of them were dated. Mm. You could only just tell that they were different because a lot of the scenes were different. So I would imagine that that would have been probably maybe early 1995 at the latest that that would have happened. So there wasn't a whole lot of time between when this script came and when they decided to go a different direction. Right. That makes sense that they yeah. probably just looked at this and said, thanks, but no thanks, and then moved on. 
And then I saw that some people were thinking that this was going to be directed by Scott Spiegel, who was kind of a grindhouse filmmaker. He came up with Sam Raimi, worked on the Evil Dead films with him, Mm -hmm. made some horror movies throughout the 90s. I can't remember them off the top of my head. I know he did From Dust Till Dawn Part 2, among some others. However, he was attached to an even earlier version of Halloween 6, where him and Quentin Tarantino who was just bursting into Miramax at the time, had actually pitched a treatment that Tarantino was going to co-write with Scott Spiegel and then Spiegel would direct it, where it would go back to the babysitter murders concept. Mm. A series of short films, like each one focused on a babysitter, as Michael Myers starts doing his thing. It, kind of like, what was his grindhouse one? Uh, Death Proof. Death Proof. Death Proof. Where it's like, here's the story of this group of girls. They get killed. Now here's the story of this group of girls. Right. They happen in the same night. It's still him kind of chaining around, but I think it would also be kind of nonlinear in the Tarantino way. That was their pitch, and it never went further than a treatment, and that treatment has never even surfaced. Hmm. And as far as I know, Spiegel was never involved beyond that. As far as I know, this script never went any further than this draft. I haven't seen any evidence of it going through further development, of it being shopped around. I saw one person mention the Akkads hated it, but I can't find a source on that. And I don't know if maybe they're mistaking that with the Dennis Etchison draft where they did hate that. Yeah, that's the problem with like a lot of these scripts from what I can gather is there's just not as much of a history to mm-hmm. what actually happened and why things weren't accepted or not unless the writer just comes out and says something. Yeah, and otherwise I don't have any other history on it. We're going to break up the synopsis. The synopsis is going to be a little long and in-depth and we'll kind of discuss it as we go along. But even before we get there, let me just ask, do you recommend this script and would you have liked to have seen them film it? Not even in place of the one they used, but just would you in general have liked to have seen them film this? I don't recommend it. I would be curious enough to watch it. I'm not sure if that makes entirely sense, but I don't think it's a great script. I am going to guess it's probably an early draft. Unlike the last script we talked about, it doesn't say which draft this is. Usually if it's just a date, that's the first draft. It's quite possible this would have been polished up a bit. The dialogue would have been tightened up. But the overall beats are fine, except for some weirdness that happens towards the end. I just don't think it's great. It's a perfectly serviceable script. But because of those weird bits that we'll get to at the end, I kind of want to see it just because I think it'd be hilarious. Or it could have been terrible. If it was done today, it might actually be effective, but it would be a completely different animal today than if it was made in 1995. I'm fully on board with you there. Uh, (laughs) I would not want to see this script filmed as is. That said, I think 70% of this script, while not a spectacular screenplay, is fine. Yeah. 70% of this script, yeah, film it. It's fine. It'll be a perfectly watchable midline sequel. The double-edged sword of that remaining 30% is that, on the one hand, it's so bad and so misguidedly bizarre that it messes up the entire remainder of the story. But on the other hand, it's so specific and so isolated that you could strip all that out and just build in a new 30% to patch up that 70% you already have. Right. You could just rework the structure of those reveals in the second half change the climax, and otherwise keep the majority of the script as is, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be a perfect midline horror movie sequel. Yeah. It's definitely not going to put a notch on the original, but it would have been a perfectly watchable popcorn horror film. Yes. As it is, it's Halloween Resurrection. (laughs) Which, again, really interesting ideas. There's good portions of it. The bad stuff is really bad. (laughs) (laughs) We open on a rainy night as a woman pulls into a gas station. The attendant turns out to be a killer who goes after her, but he ends up being cut down by Michael Myers, who's been hiding in her backseat the entire time. As Michael turns on the woman, she suddenly wakes up from the nightmare. This is Dana Childress, early 20s, who has this lingering obsession with Michael Myers, not only seeing him in dreams, but in odd flashes that turn out to be normal people or shadows. Her psychiatrist says this anxiety might be tied to repressed childhood trauma. By day, Dana is a burgeoning reporter for Channel 6 News in Chicago, and when her producers are looking for a hot piece, she pitches a profile on Haddonfield, which just voted to celebrate Halloween for the first time in five years since the latest killing spree of 1989. This will be her first solo field piece, and lending some supporting oversight is seasoned and handsome reporter Robert Clifton. It's a perfect handsome reporter name. It is. This is Robert Clifton coming to you from Channel 6 in Chicago. <laughs> And now for the weather. 
Before heading out, Dana pays a visit to her 84-year-old Grammy, dropping off groceries and having a body chat about men in game shows while calling attention to Grammy's distinctive nose bowl and the bronze figurine of a soldier on her shelf. Remember those for later. Uh-huh. In Haddonfield, late 20s Tommy Doyle is launching a one-man protest against the return of Halloween, walking the streets with a megaphone, reading off all the names of Michael's victims. It's a very unsuccessful campaign, as the people largely ignore him and prep for their Halloween celebrations. The new sheriff, Norv Littman, keeps telling him to knock it off, and his housemates, the teenage douchebags Mickey and Bad News, tell him to stay in his attic room and leave their upcoming kegger alone, despite it being his house. <laughs> In his room, Tommy has built an investigatory shrine of Michael Myers, the murders, and Celtic symbolism, and has begun exploring a virtual reality program called Sam Hain, which recreates ancient rituals of sacrifice on altars made of severed body parts involving a high priest and a figure in a white robe with a deer mask. Desperate, Tommy tracks down Dr. Sam Loomis at a nearby hospital, but instead of arriving at an office, he finds that Loomis is now a patient in the mental ward. After a lifetime of obsession, paranoia, and a pair of heart attacks, Loomis is tired and just wants to be at peace. He has no answers for Tommy, no solutions, just frenzied thoughts he wants to let go of. He tells Tommy it's time for some new blood to take on the fight, and gives him a talisman in the form of a very familiar-looking figurine of a bronze soldier. In the city, plans for Halloween parties have already taken on the form of night-before-Halloween parties. Leaving one are a group of frat boys dressed as droogs from A Clockwork Orange who delightedly begin to beat on a homeless man they find sleeping in an alley. The man rises up under their assault and turns the tables, brutally slaughtering them, the last by shoving a live rat down his throat. This man is a ragged, tattered, maskless Michael Myers. Returning to a homeless shelter where he's a quietly acknowledged regular, Michael stops when he sees a TV promo for Dana's upcoming feature on Haddonfield. Breathing heavily and snapping some fucker's arm, Michael walks out. So let's start with our protagonist of this story. What did you think of the character Dana as she's being set up here? I could tell that she was going to be our main character. She's not really well developed as far as her personality. I think this script is a lot better than the Halloween 4 script we reviewed, where none of the characters had any personality at all or distinguishing characteristics. She has more than what any of those characters did, but she still feels like generic last girl. I think she's a good setup. Again, she's not a teenager. She's not a college student. I like that she's someone who's already gone out. She's got a foothold on a career. She's already a reporter at a station, though she's still looking for her big first out-of-studio story where she gets to take a crew along. The big thing is most of her persona is built around either looking up the story or her being scared by these flashes she gets of Michael Myers being around her that turns out to not be anyone. Mm -hmm. And there's not enough to really say, who is this character? What are her philosophies? Why is she a journalist? What is it about this story? I mean, we find out later on part of what's driving her to this story, but who is this person? Yeah, we don't really get too much depth on that. No, she really doesn't have much agency. Like, she's mm -hmm. not actively trying to do anything other than file this report for the news station. Yeah. It's not a bad way of introducing her, but she just needs something else to motivate her. Yeah, the character of Robert Clifton is introduced is just, they never really do anything with him. He's just kind of a mentor figure. Other than a couple of maybe aside lines of a potential romance, there's never really a romance. There's not a rivalry. Yeah. Him being a seasoned reporter is never like, you know, he's never trying to steal the story or anything like that. On the one hand, I like that it kind of goes the unexpected route. He's just a very friendly mentor figure. But on the other, it's like there's no real drama there. Right. I get the impression that they were banking on there being some chemistry on the set. Mm -hmm. There's a few moments where I think they build up a little bit of romance vibes. I think there's a couple drop lines, yeah, yeah. but no big, long, passionate kiss at the end or anything like that. Moving into Haddonfield, what I find amusing is that there's not much difference between Tommy as he is in this and the Tommy that he is in the Halloween 6 that they ended up making. Yeah, it seems like every version of Tommy is broken, isn't it? Wasn't he living in an attic too then? <laughs> you might be right. And then what's funny is he also had his computer software of Celtic runes, which is basically what the VR headset devolved into. I wonder if something like the Akkads or somebody like had said, you know, kids love computers. Uh, put something with computers. Yeah. And when this version was accepted, they said the same thing to whoever wrote the version of six that we got. Yeah, it could just be you know, like, hey, let's bring back Tommy. What would Tommy be like now? Everyone just kind of gravitated in the similar direction. Yeah, that's more likely. I hesitate to get more in depth into any of this discussion because it's a lot of setup for a lot of stuff that's going to pay off later. Yeah. Let's talk about Sam Loomis, because this is like the one big sequence of Sam Loomis when Tommy goes to visit him. What do you think about that scene? 
I was a little surprised that this is all we get of him, but I did like the concept. I really do. I like the idea that after so many years and after seeing so many horrors, Sam Loomis is just a broken individual. He is just, I just want to rest. Yeah. I'm tired of all these horrors that I see. Yeah, I get the feeling he checked himself into the ward instead of like oh, yeah. being dragged into it. I totally agree with you there. And I think that he is tired. And that's an yeah. interesting way to portray him after being so active. But I do think that makes sense that somebody might just, after fighting evil for so long, just be like, let somebody else deal with it. I just need rest. It also is fitting because to have only the one scene works because I know Donald Pleasance was already in very poor health at the time. Right. To the point where while making the actual Halloween 6, he died during the production of it. Mm -hmm. I think this wouldn't have been a bad send off for the character. It's sad that he himself has now become a patient in the mental ward. But what I like is that there is also this degree of peace to him. Mm -hmm. He found the quiet. And what's funny is like all the sounds you hear of the other patients around him is almost comforting to him because he's so used to it. Mm -hmm. You know, it really does play up the fact that in Halloween 6, they were setting up Tommy as becoming the new Loomis. This has a literal passing on of the torch. Yes. In the form of the little bronze figurine. But even then, it's like he even has the whole line about it's time for some new blood. It's not a bad send-off. And I gotta say, most of this script, I actually don't really have much of a problem with the actual writing. Right. Some of the stagings of certain horror scenes are a little awkward, but I think the descriptions are nice. They really pull you into the environment. There's occasional fun little cheeky quirks that he'll throw in. And I think the dialogue actually has a pretty nice flow to it. That does bring some personality and I think would have played well on screen. And I think this scene is a good hallmark of that, where it's like Tommy visits Loomis and the torch gets passed. Could be a very corny sequence and it's actually feels very nice. Yeah. And it feels like a natural conclusion. It makes sense for that character. Mm -hmm. Considering Donald Pleasance's health at the time that it was written, even if he was in better health, they knew that they couldn't just keep bringing back this old man for every single sequel. Mm -hmm. It makes sense to want to pass the torch and bring Tommy in to fill that role. Yeah. I'm betting that that's the reason why there's that overlap between this and the finished film is the producers were like, Donald isn't going to be around much longer. Hey, can we bring Tommy back? Because Friday the 13th just had a Loomis character named Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted a Friday the 13th Halloween crossover built around the two Tommies who are basically filling the same. <laughs> Can we get Tommy Wiseau to play one of the Tommies? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. And I want a recreation of the 70s film Tommy starring Tommy Wiseau. <laughs> We'll get into more of what's going on with Halloween in the town in the next segment. But one thing that I do love is one of the great character defining moments of Tommy is that he's just by himself walking up and down the streets of Haddonfield with a megaphone, reading off the names of victims until the sheriff literally comes up, tells him to stop and takes his megaphone. I could see a Paul Rudd comedy scene built around that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I totally can see that. And like the cop takes the megaphone and goes away and Paul Rudd's just like sitting there. We, we can't get that back. I do like the fact that they acknowledge all these victims, though. Mm -hmm. Like, it's something that a lot of horror films don't do is acknowledge the impact that yeah. it has on people. And listing off the names, you're like, when you think about it, that is really upsetting to think this one guy killed, you know. Actually, like, four has, like, a huge body count of, like, 20. You know? <laughs> yeah. At some point, they say, like, 34 or something like that people died, yeah. which I don't know if the writer actually went back and counted or if he just was pulling a number out. I did find it interesting that Jamie Lloyd is in that list, too. That's the thing is, we only get little glimpses of Jamie mm -hmm. and her fate. And I kind of like that there's this ambiguity of she went missing. Yeah. And she's still on milk cartons and all that stuff. And like we later get a flash that yeah, she was probably in a cage and sacrifice. But yeah, they at least give you a sense that, yeah, she's gone. Mm -hmm. And they do also mention Laurie Strode at times who had died and was traumatized by the incident and all that. And like we'll get to later when we meet the parents of Lindsay Wallace that we find out that she went through psych for a long time and is now living in New York. It's again kind of an interesting overlap with that Halloween 4 script of dealing with a town trying to rise out of the infamy of its past. Mm -hmm. Let's wait before we talk about the virtual reality program. Let's wait till we get a little deeper down that hole. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll get into it. Oh, yes. Just you wait. <laughs> it's Cyberween. <laughs> oh. Any thoughts on Mickey and bad news? That is one of the greatest slash worst name pairings I've ever heard. Other than that, it feels weird because Tommy's supposed to be in his mid-late 20s, I 29, think. 29, yeah. He's renting out his house to 17-year-olds? Yes. 
that seems odd. And they're both like just the worst people. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, while I was reading this script, I know they're too old for the parts, but I just kept getting like Pete Davidson and Bobby Moynihan. <laughs> <laughs> they felt like a sketch. It was just so ridiculously douchebaggy. Yeah, they're not characters. They're stereotypes and they're not fleshed out any more than that. But I do kind of love that amusing thing of like Tommy is the hero protester who waffles whenever he's actually faced with a confrontation mm -hmm. <laughs> to the point where it's like these two teenage tenants of his own house have taken over the house and forced him to lock himself in the attic. Right. That is an interesting character quirk. And that's something that I think probably could have been built up more in other drafts is that Tommy is not really the hero rising to meet the call as he's the scared little boy who has to face the boogeyman of his past. Right. For all of his bluster, he does get scared. Mm hmm Mickey and Bad News refer to him as Trembling Tommy. Exactly. It's an interesting idea that, again, another draft could have fleshed out. I think the next big chunk of this is the reveal that Michael Myers has been living as a homeless man in downtown Chicago. <laughs> Any thoughts? I honestly don't necessarily mind that. Considering we had a film where he was unconscious for a full year and it was kept by a homeless man. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's a huge stretch. A, I don't buy him going to Chicago for whatever reason, unless that was where he chased Jamie down to. I think that Haddonfield in this is a suburb of Illinois, so it's not that far from Chicago. True, but it just feels like if he was to hang out somewhere, I think he'd hang out in Haddonfield. Yeah. Like if he was just waiting for the incident that we'll get into as we get the reveal, there needed to be something else for him to be doing other than just hanging out as a Chicago bum. I don't mind necessarily him being homeless or like living like a bum, but Chicago just feels like such a big city. Like it almost feels like Jason takes Manhattan. It just feels like a strange, like, let's bring Michael Myers to Chicago, and then they don't actually do anything with it. Maybe I'm just focusing on the wrong part there, but it seems strange to me, like a strange choice. I like it because it's very outside the box. I get why it's like people will hit that and be like, wait, no. Like to the point where I know I have not yet seen Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, but I know a big part of that is drifting, maskless, homeless Michael Myers. Mm. So I'm going to be curious to see how there's been that parallel when we get to it. But I like it because he was a killer with a specific goal who achieved that goal. And now what? Yeah. So many of the other sequels will just be like, well, now he'll just go and kill all the people who moved into his house. Or now he'll just wander over to this other group and start killing them. And it's like, Michael had a specific goal. I mean, obviously, we're going to get to a twist later on in the script that more defines that goal, which we'll get to when we get to it. But I kind of like that idea of he had a purpose. He has fulfilled that purpose, but he's not a machine who's just going to shut down and go into hibernation mode. He's just kind of a drifter now. Right. He's adrift. He can't really stay in Haddonfield because it's an area where you would notice if there's this giant shambling guy wandering around in tatters. That makes sense. In the city, it's easier to hide. Yeah. And it makes it easier for the inciting incident as to why he goes back. And I also like that it's that great play on Clockwork Orange where it's the guys dressed as droogs. I don't know if you need to get that specific, but it's a bunch of revelers from a party who decide to beat up a homeless man who turns out to be Michael Myers who kills them all. With a rat. With At least one of them with a rat. One of them with a rat, yes. One thing I, I have a problem with just how ridiculously over the top some of the deaths are in this movie. Yeah. They're almost cartoony. You know, you said that it was connected to the Scott Spiegel who worked on the Evil Dead. It feels almost like that, some of the action bits, they feel as over the top as some of the Evil Dead stuff. Yeah. I mean, bringing up Scott Spiegel, like I know one of his big films was Intruder, which was a horror film set in a mini mart, which was just all about how over the top spectacle you can get. Mm. By the time you got to this point in the slasher film wave, Nightmare on Elm Street had all become about how outlandish you can get. Friday the 13th was all about how outlandish you can get. Yeah. It wasn't really until Scream came back that it kind of stripped it down, where it became more about the emotion of being attacked and killed and focused back on stabbing and slashing. Yeah. This is one where I would have gone in and stripped down. And to be fair, Halloween had already been falling into this too, even going back as far as Halloween 2, where they even reshot the death scenes to make them even more spectacular and over the top. And, you know, like Halloween 4, where he's literally just like ripping people's faces open with his bare hands, you know? Right. Halloween 2 had like the scene with the hot tub. Yeah. Then there's the one woman that he knocked out and connected to a tube to her arm, so she bled out onto the floor of the room. 
I don't have a problem with films that go over the top. Like, I love the Dr. Fives movies that do it. But these ones don't really feel that clever. No. And he gets so caught up in detailing the gore in ways that you know would never make it to the finished cut. Like, a guy gets his throat cut, and as he's trying to scream, the inner part of his neck pops out. Right. You know, or stuff like that. Or, like, eyeball jelly and all that. And it's like, you know, that's more distracting from the story than it is playing a part in it. Right. Like the rat death. I don't think that that would have actually worked mm. on screen. Like, I just don't think there's a way you could do that and actually make it not look silly. And I can't imagine, like, whoever would make this film would want the first true Michael Myers killing to be silly. Yeah. Phil Rosenberg, he strikes me as a at least modestly talented writer. I would like to read some of his other writing if there is any. But it definitely feels like a young writer who gets to write their first slasher movie, so they're kind of going all in on it. Mm -hmm. And it's like they haven't learned, here's where you've overstepped, now pull back a little. Yeah. I noticed like both this script and the Halloween 4 script we read have a lot of references to other horror films, which just yeah. feels like something that a kid who's excited to be working on, like, oh, I'm just going to acknowledge all the things that inspired me and all that, rather than just trying to make your own. It definitely feels like, hey, this is my first draft putting all my thoughts down. Oh, wait, you mean we can't get the rights? <laughs> Yeah. I wondered if they would be able to actually film, like, the Droogs. Yeah. Because it starts off almost, like, remaking that scene. It's literally redoing the scene from Clockwork Orange. And given how many hurdles they had to go through to do the Shining sequence in Ready Player One, I imagine that there would be a little bit of a protectiveness on Warner Brothers. But yeah, Warner Brothers would have had that movie, and I don't think they would have let Miramax... Yeah. <laughs> And Kubrick was still alive at this time, yes. too, so I imagine he might have had control over it. It's a scene that you can easily redo where it's just drunken frat guys leaving a party. You can even just have one of them drop the referential line about, let's have a little ultra violence. Yeah. Without having the actual full costumes. I still like the idea of it, that, yeah, it's a bunch of guys trying to be the Drugs and they end up failing in a terrible way. Right. They picked on the wrong guy. But it could still just be frat guys want to eat up a homeless guy. Yeah. It could still work. I totally agree. And then I kind of love that thing of Michael Myers. Myers returns to a homeless shelter where people recognize him. He's a person who's been drifting. He's been in this life for a while. And then he sees that news story on TV and it's like, oh, oh, the button's been pushed. Mm -hmm. The switch has been flipped. I am good to go. He snaps that guy's arm. <laughs> yep. One other thing is I'd be curious, given what they did with the Rob Zombie films and with the more recent Halloween film, I wonder how much they would show of the maskless Michael Myers, because they never really describe it, but you would have him walking around without a mask. They don't say he has a hood on or anything. No. I mean, you could easily make it that way mm -hmm. or just shoot him from behind. They make reference to the heavy breathing quite a bit long before he gets the mask. So I think that would probably have been the big clue so that way you could film from behind and not actually have to worry about yeah. showing his face too much. But I do think there's a few times where people react to his face and they're supposed to be freaked out. Yeah. I don't know that you'd need a Michael who has a freaky face. I know. He's just old and scarred, you know? Yeah. Not to jump ahead, but that's kind of what I liked about the new film is that, you know, yeah, he's got some wounds on him, but he's mostly just an old guy. Yeah. They don't make him like a Freddy Krueger or Jason Voorhees. Yeah. He doesn't need to be. And that was the thing, like the original film, he was the face of innocence. Yeah. Doing these yeah. horrible things. It actually makes more sense to actually make him just a writer dude. Just remind me of that scene in Jason Takes Manhattan where, like, the gang comes up to him. He literally just lifts up the mask and they scream and run away. <laughs> <laughs> As the news team enters Haddonfield, we meet the rest of Dana and Clifton's red shirt squad. Driver Andy, sound guy Tony, and cameraman Blake. After going over records of Michael's normal brain scan, they stop at Hardee's, a local department store which isn't to be confused with the fast food joint Hardee's. <laughs> I was surprised they did that given that Hardee's was around at the time and still is. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's run by crusty salesman Hardy Lomax, who's more than happy to film a segment showing off his Michael Myers masks and trading cards. As the crew leaves and begins filming sound bites around town, we see Sheriff Littman is with retired Sheriff Ben Meeker as they discuss the divide that settled over Haddonfield. There's still old inhabitants, some friends and family who still remember the victims and plan to put memorial candles in their windows to ward off trick-or-treaters, but there was a mass exodus of survivors who fled, leaving a void filled by new generations who turned things into a glossy suburb that's trying to bury the past. Hence the fresh-faced town council who voted to reinstate Halloween, which Meeker took as a personal betrayal. Whereas Littman sees the joys and costumes and decorations and feels it's time to let the new era of kids be kids again. This culminates in the news crew discovering Meeker when they creep into the abandoned Myers home to shoot some footage. Meeker is there just like he's been every year since his daughter died in Halloween 4, standing guard and waiting for Michael. 
After briefly running into Dana at a town hall protest, Tommy returns home and is shocked to see that Mickey and Bad News' Halloween party decorations include the gravestone of Judith Meyer, which they stole from the cemetery. Despite his arguments, they bully him back into his room about masturbation. Meanwhile, at the cemetery, strange noises and lights begin to appear in the trench left by the gravestone. Throughout much of this, a hell and damnation priest, Father Carpenter, who may or may not be the priest from Halloween 4, we'll discuss it, has begun springing into frame at surprise moments, first hijacking the protest for a sermon where he seems to single out Dana in a moment of recognition, then popping in front of her van to look creepy. As night settles in, Michael returns to town. His first stop is Hardy's, where he spears Lomax with a barbecue fork and gets himself a new mask. Then he heads to the graveyard, where the caretaker is angrily chasing off the news crew who just discovered the missing headstone. After Michael stabs the caretaker's wife in the eye with a piece of candy, he claims the familiar feel of her butcher's knife. When the caretaker returns and tries to gun Michael down, the killer pounds the man's face into a food processor. Let's just kind of sort out these ties to Halloween 4. We have the sheriff. When I read the script, I forgot that it wasn't the sheriff from the first movie. But it still makes sense that it would be the sheriff from part four, because I remember there was a whole sequence where everybody holed up in the sheriff's home, which had all of its security locks and had its guns and everything. And yet Michael still got in and still killed the daughter and still killed all the deputies and everything. Right. So I could still see this sheriff being traumatized by that. Mm -hmm. What did you think about his sequences? I liked it. It's a big info dump, but I think it does flavor what's going on in Haddonfield mm -hmm. and just why a news team would come in and want to cover this. It's a nice little note, like going back to the list that Tommy was making, like Michael Myers, even when he's gone, he still has like an impact. Like this town has changed. They didn't want to celebrate Halloween for however many years. And they're just starting to get back into, okay, it's safe. The people who were most deeply impacted moved away because they were so broken by Michael's impact. It may not serve the plot other than just like info dump, but I think it also gives a good flavor to what's going on with Haddonfield. Again, it's an interesting parallel to that Halloween 4 script, where again, it's right. a town trying to recover and trying to put that behind it and move on. I think the setup in this film works better, but again, it doesn't really build in any direction. No. The problem with the Halloween 4 one is like it had a lot to say about it, but without anything to actually say about it. It was trying to set up a generational divide. Yeah, it wanted to make it the central theme, but it actually didn't have anything to actually expand or make it mm -hmm. important to the story. This is just more flavor. This is just something that gives you like Halloween's kind of starting to become acceptable again, but still feels just a little dangerous, which is yeah. what that energy that you need to like give a little bit of tension to the story. You know, I say that there's like specific chunks you could have taken out of this. I think you could have then also brought in chunks that would flesh this out even more because I like this setup. Again, you don't need to go like that whole generational divide like Halloween 4 was setting up of like, you know, the parents versus the kids. But again, this is the whole outsider mentality versus insider mentality. The few old holdouts who are still there still just don't want to be reminded of what they've lost. And this whole new wave of people is like, yeah, but we never experienced that. And he's been gone for years and that's all in the past. And that's what I like about that whole conversation between Meeker and the current sheriff is the current sheriff just points at the kids. This is a holiday that's about the kids, you know, and letting kids cut loose and have fun. And that's something that I think could have almost been more focused on is the child aspect of Halloween. Mm -hmm. So much of this story will focus on the teenagers and all that stuff. But I think what we could have also brought in is we're trying to bring this to a new generation of kids, but ultimately setting up a new generation of kids who will now be scarred by it in new ways. Right. I think that's something that you could have built on more. But I still, again, I like all these scenes of everyone just talking, like all these sound bites they get, all the discussions about, is it time? No, it's not. What about the victims? Well, what about the new people? It has its debate and then it moves on. Yeah. Instead of dwelling on it for the entire script, like Helen 4. Yeah. I like all the little shots around town. I like when they're interviewing the guy at the department store, which again, reminded me of the drive-in theater guy mm -hmm. in the last script where it's like, yeah, but you know, it's business and the kids. And this one was more entertaining where it's like, hey, all my Michael Myers masks are selling like hotcakes. And hey, you want to buy some serial killer trading cards? Michael Myers, the hot item. It's funny. Yeah. And I also like that his character is introduced as a character who is all nose and ears hair. <laughs> <laughs> I was amused that he was selling 
what was supposed to be fake knives that you could stab <laughs> your buddies with. And then he like demonstrates on a cantaloupe, which cuts it right open. I'm like, A, why is he just have cantaloupe laying around during Halloween season? Don't you? But also, it was a funny joke. Yeah, yeah, where, where he's like demonstrating these fake knives and it's like, oh crap, <laughs> it's a real one. <laughs> this is one of the real ones. And wouldn't that have been funny if like Michael Myers, when he killed him and took the mask, used what Michael thought was a real knife on him only to have one of the fake ones. Yeah, I kept expecting it to come back. I think that's also something that they could have done to add a bit more personality to Dana is at the point when they're at the graveyard and they're, they're getting shots of the gravestones and all that stuff and they discover the missing one, you do have some of that debate about where are we crossing the line between telling an actual story and slipping into like gaudy tabloid journalism. Mm -hmm. Instead of like having that be phrased by the I really don't care for any of her camera crew. We're all just disposable guys. Right. But I think that could have been a more interesting debate to be had. Not really a conflict, but a debate to be had between her and the more seasoned reporter is this is her big shot. She wants to do it right. She wants to tell a good story, a solid story. And he's just kind of like, yeah, that's cool. But this is the stuff that helps sell it. Mm -hmm. That would have been more interesting to kind of have that philosophy there. And then again, counter that between the new and the old philosophies around Halloween. Yeah. And he could have had her be, let's get to the truth, and he be more about the spectacle, which would, again, tie into, like, her wanting to know the truth. Nobody wants the truth. They want the lingering questions. Right. And that could have actually been an interesting debate as far as when you're trying to tell a quote-unquote origin story. And also just her wanting to get to the truth, mm -hmm. which, again, would go back to what we eventually find out. Yeah, and I think it's a very typical characterization, but I still yeah. think it could have worked. I think it could have still fit well with a lot of her character's journey through the story. Yeah. Out of all the main characters, she's the biggest blank. I mean, she reacts well in situations, but we just don't know her as a person. Yeah, she's not a ditzy person or anything like that. She's not a stereotype, but she needed to be fleshed out yeah. more. Yeah. We have our first meeting of Tommy and Dana, and then what's interesting is there's not a big moment out of it. They just have a little interaction, go their separate ways, and then later on in the story, they realize that they need each other. Yeah. This is clearly our main character with Dana, and then Tommy is our new Loomis. Mm -hmm. You would expect their meeting to stand out, but I actually appreciate that. No, it's they both have different things going on right now. Father Carpenter. This is, again, where we kind of get into a bit of an interesting thing, because Halloween 4 had that character of the toothless, kooky old grinning priest who gave Dr. Loomis a ride one time, and they sang songs, and he was a Bible thumper and all that stuff. The thing is, in Halloween 4, that character was named Reverend Jackson P. Sayer, whereas this script seems to be referencing that character as someone reappearing, but is now calling him Father Carpenter. Yeah. I don't know if it was just the writer wasn't aware of the character had a name or what. Yeah. I don't know if it was just something where they figured that no one would remember. And admittedly, like, this was the age of VHS, so, like, the, you could go back and look at that stuff, so I don't know why they wouldn't reference the exact name. Especially when you're working with the producers who made the film and say, hey, what was the name of that character? Right. Let me look at the previous scripts and casting sheets. Yeah. <laughs> It could be like he just thought he wanted to have a nod to John Carpenter and just this was his way of doing it. Flattering him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What did you think about what did you think about Mickey and Bad News stealing Judith Meyer's gravestone to use as a decoration in their Halloween party? I mean I don't know. Like it feels like it just doesn't really pay off. I don't think that's a huge spoiler to say. No. Pops up for your author script. Yeah, it's there to be a reference to what happened in the first film. Well, I think it's also to open up the supernatural trench, which we'll get to. <laughs> we'll get into that. Oh, yes. But then I also was like, okay, you have Tommy versus Mickey and Bad News arguing over a tombstone that they stole, and then they start mocking him with all the various ways in which a person can describe masturbation. Mm -hmm. Again, I would like to see the Paul Rudd scene that that would have turned into. Yeah. Yeah, I think if this <laughs> had Paul Rudd, it would have played completely differently. Yeah. But we don't even know if Rudd was cast at this time. No, I have a feeling he probably wasn't. The rest of the casting was pretty different. Yeah. So there's not like a one-to-one -one conversion. Yeah. But the headstone, it felt like, yeah, it's setting up something that'll happen in the last act. It's literally opening the door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll say more things about the strange goings on in the trench left by the tombstone. And let me just see if we had anything else. So Michael returns to I actually like that scene where it's the little girl pushing a baby carriage. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, that's something that you could have used if we're going to start building on, you know, this is for the kids and kids and loss of innocence. It's a literal child pushing the motherhood image of a baby carriage. Yeah. If you wanted to play that into something, you could have played that into something. Who literally runs into Michael Myers. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like that, you know, Michael doesn't do anything. He doesn't give a shit. It's a little kid. Right. I love that the Halloween series have made a regular thing out of children run into Michael Myers. 
works. Yeah. I wouldn't say he would never kill a child, but for him, if it's not an immediate threat or somebody who's in the way of something that he wants. He has his plans. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, and also, you know, part one, he ran into trick-or-treaters. Part two, he ran into trick-or-treaters. The new one, he ran into trick-or-treaters. And the new one, he also killed the kid. But yeah. Yeah. The new one was going for a different thing. Oh, yeah. So he goes to Hardy's, and again, instead of building off of the knife gag, he grabs a barbecue fork. Despite the fact that Hardy is facing him, he somehow stabs Hardy. This is where I have a problem with the way the kill scenes are described, is that mm. there's like a weird geography where it's like people are suddenly standing in different areas than they were. So it's like, despite the fact that Hardy is facing him, he stabs Hardy through the back of the head, and then the fork pops out of his mouth with the guy's dentures on him. Yeah. Sure. It's a thing. And then I kind of love both Michael and the news crew go to the cemetery and they discover the gravestone is missing. I kind of love the caretaker is literally out there with the news crew waving a gun around at them saying, how dare you? Yeah. (laughs) He is the ultimate get off my lawn. (laughs) His job is literally to make people get off this lawn. And he is the perfect get off my lawn guy. Yeah, he fits that scene very well. I don't know why him and his wife were killed by Michael, other than body count. He needed the butcher knife. Which, again, we already had the setup for the gag at Hardy's. Yeah, they could have done it. No, that would be funny if it's like he stabs Hardy and it turns out to be a fake knife. So Michael just drops it and grabs the next knife. And he just keeps going through all those knives until he gets to that real one. Yeah. And then, yeah, he's like stabbing the woman in the eye with candy. I think it was a sugar daddy. Yep. And then, of course, the screener is describing an all of her eye gelatin. Yeah. Then Michael finally recovers a butcher's knife. And the first person he kills, he doesn't use the butcher's knife. He uses a food processor. Which, A, I've used food processor before. That's a heavy-duty food processor if you're going to kill somebody with it. Yeah, jawbones are thick. They spin pretty fast, and they can slice up your face a lot, but it's not going to... Yeah, but they're going to catch on the bone. Yeah, it's not going to do anything more than need you to have, like, major reconstructive surgery. It'll skin your face, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. That the entire point of the scene is for Michael to get a knife, and then he doesn't use the knife. Yeah. There's a lot of areas of the script where I do like Phil Rosenberg's writing. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's very good at the kill scenes. No. And I have a feeling like a good director would have probably used it as a guideline. Oh, I would have already clipped them out and rewritten them. Yeah. I don't know who would have directed this, but I have a feeling the action would have completely changed by the time we actually get it on screen. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to have Michael kill the caretaker and his wife, I would have saved that for the climax when we go back to the cemetery. That would make more sense. You don't need to have them be the reason he gets the knife, because you've already set up the knife at the last person that he killed, have him get the knife from there, Mm -hmm. and then save them as another stretch to break up that chase scene at the climax. Which, to be fair, I would throw out the entire climax at the cemetery, but still, if we're committing to it, which I wouldn't, that's a way you could at least make that better. (laughs) We're measuring by inches, not by feet here, but that would have improved a little bit. At least I'm giving you options. Uh Uh-huh. The news team arrives at the home of Frank and June Wallace, who still live in their home even after it was the site of the original murders in 1978. They tell us that Lindsay moved to New York after years of therapy, then dig out some old home movies they think the team would be interested in. They show a park where little Michael Myers and his sister Judith laugh and play like seemingly normal children, but a young father carpenter is also there, and there's a woman who turns, revealing a distinctive mole on her nose. It's Grammy. Dana's old Grammy. Grammy is the grandmother of Judith and Michael. Grammy is also the Grammy of Dana. The meaning of this suddenly hits Dana as she rushes to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. After some shenanigans involving Michael looming around the house, looking in windows and ringing the doorbell, which is dismissed as partying teenagers, his hand is sliced open by the slammed door, but otherwise he leaves everyone else alone. Dana keeps her revelations quiet from the group, even as they can see that she was affected by the footage. Learning Tommy still lives in the attic of his family home across the street, they try to score an interview but have problems wading through the wild party being thrown by Mickey and Bad News, and even when they reach Tommy's door, he can't hear them because he's hooked into the VR game which is now showing him a simulation of Haddonfield, the caretaker at the graveyard, and the party below. It also seems to have caused a physical cut to appear on his cheek. Pulling out of the game, he sees the news van driving away outside his window and that the Channel 6 logo has been extended with smeared blood, now making it 666. What he doesn't see is that Andy the driver is dead in the bushes, meaning someone else is driving the van. When it comes to a stop, the team discovers they're in the middle of a muddy bog and that the driver's seat is now empty. Tony and Blake head off to look for Andy, but when they don't come back, Dana and Clifton try to drive away. They come across Blake's TV camera sinking in the mud. Rewinding the footage, they see the two getting killed by Michael. Clifton hops in the driver's seat and tries to peel out, but the wheels won't catch on the mud. 
In the back, Dana sees Michael outside as he lodges a branch in the door handle and stalks to the front to attack Clifton. She hears a struggle up front, and when the van suddenly takes off again, Dana has no clue who's driving. And we'll leave it on that cliffhanger there. Bringing up the Wallaces, it was interesting talking to some actual victims, survivors. Mm -hmm. Well, no, technically they're not the survivors of victims, but people were killed in their house. Right. Which they continue to live in. Yeah, I didn't think about that, but that does feel a little morbid when you put it that way. (laughs) Which is why their daughter probably doesn't visit very often. I did like that Lindsay got away in this version, you know, got therapy, moved to New York, is doing good. Yeah. And it is kind of interesting, given that both Lindsay and Tommy were in Halloween 4. They had small parts, but they were there. Yeah. You could have be that, yeah, Lindsay, when she had her opportunity to get out, she got out. So let's go ahead and pull the band in on the big twist that Dana is now a second lost sister of the Myers family. Yeah. How does that work in the timeline of things? Like, I mean, no idea. is she supposed to be the twin? I just don't understand. Like, it feels really fake. Well, and she's 22. So she would be younger than Jamie Lee Curtis would have been. Yeah, so she would have been born in, this is 94, so she would have been born in 76. She would have been like a two-year-old at the time of the original film. Yeah. We never know what happens to Michael's parents. It's assumed that he probably killed them or they died somehow. No, no, because they had him institutionalized. Lori entered the system. Yeah. Because she was kind of taken in by state custody. We don't know exactly when. It's assumed that they're dead by the point in this film is what I'm getting at. So it's possible they may have had a kid like after they got Lori put away. But it feels like a plot convenience. We we need more Myerses because that's what Michael is all about is killing Myerses. Maybe she's like a half-sibling, you know, like the parents had split up. Honestly, you could have had the lines, well, Michael ran all out of sisters, now he's looking for the cousins. Yeah, like I was expecting, like Grammy could was... Be, yeah, if it's the grandmother that's the tie, you could have yeah. that be a distant enough family relation that it's not another sister. That would have made sense, but if they decided to go with the easiest route. But again, if Michael was going to go that far on the family tree, he would have already been pursuing it instead of just being a homeless guy in Chicago. He seems to react when he sees the picture of Dana. Like yeah. that's what sets him off. Well, and that's the other thing is, though, you get the shots of Michael and Judith playing as children. Where's Lori? Yeah. Why isn't Lori in that footage? Yeah, it, it just, it doesn't make any sense. It's no. something done for plot convenience. I don't necessarily mind the idea per se, but the way they do it is so ungraceful. You just need a few dropped lines saying like, oh, the parents, like after Michael was committed, they struggled and they tried to make it work and they had another child to like fill the void and it just didn't help. As it is, it feels like a soap opera element that doesn't really fit. It's one of the things I would have cut out. Yeah. You could cut the entire origins aspect out of this. You don't need to have her have that revelatory backstory. You do not need to have the whole druidic backstory of Michael, which we'll be getting to. If you cut that out and you just make this about reporters doing a story on Haddonfield, they're bringing back Halloween, town is in a big disagreement about it, there's all these parties and protests, Michael comes back to town. Again, like a drifting, aimless Michael who's already succeeded his goal, but he's still around. Maybe it's time for a new goal. Yeah. That's enough to drive a story. Yeah. You do not need to try to be all revelatory about backstory and supernatural and all that stuff. That's your story. You have a story. You don't need to think any deeper than that. Yeah, just bringing Halloween back to Haddonfield probably would have been enough to set Michael off if they really wanted the bare minimum reason for a slasher film. It doesn't need a whole lot. That's your tagline. They brought Halloween back to Haddonfield, and he came back too. Yeah. That's your in-a-nutshell plot. Right. Which is kind of what they tried to do with that Halloween 4 script again. Yeah, yeah. The fact that that was really trash doesn't mean that you couldn't take the same idea and do something better with it. If you really wanted to, you could take that setup of Halloween 4 where it's the parents versus teenagers and it ultimately leads to a escalating confrontation between generations Mm -hmm. and use the setups in this movie to build you to that. It would involve reworking emerging things around, but I think this is better written than that one, but that one had that more interesting concept. Mm -hmm. Even just on its own terms, I think this script already has what it needs to work, but it keeps shifting to the areas where... I mean, again, that was the problem with 4, was where it set all this stuff up and then got sidetracked by all this other stuff. Right. This is a script where, again, I think really just go over, cross out a bunch of chunks, rework how to fill in those voids... Give it another fresh draft. Yeah, you could have a really fine script. Again, not a fantastic script, but as a slasher film sequel, it would be fine. 
It would be perfectly yeah. fine. It gives you enough to chew on, enough that the director can do some interesting stuff with, enough that the actors can play with. Yeah. It would make a perfectly fine Halloween 6. Yeah, the pacing's fine. The characters are serviceable enough for a horror film. It would have been enjoyable, if maybe yeah. forgettable. This, where it goes, ultimately. Yeah. There's three main threads that I think you should absolutely drop and avoid further exploration. This is one of them. Yeah. Or if you have to have her be a relative, make her a more distant relative. Don't yeah. go with a hidden sister. Then we're starting to fall into like what they actually did with Halloween 6, where it's now he's going after the Strode family that adopted Lori, who are now living in the Myers home. Yeah. And it's like, then you start to just do that whole chain of convolution of now it's like his cousin. It's his second cousin. It's his aunt twice removed. Yeah. But at least that's consistent with his motivation. <laughs> the fact that you get a sister just out of nowhere, yeah. it's just a trope. Like I said, it's straight out of soap opera. Well, and again, that was the problem of the whole brother-sister twist in the first place when they introduced in part two, is that, well, yeah, it made for some interesting storytelling. It also opened up a whole lot of can of worms. Yeah. Whereas, again, in the original film, it was just the person who walked by his door. Right. And granted, you know, if you went back to that Michael who's just looking for the next person he can target on, he wouldn't have been drifting in Chicago unless you find out that he's been killing people in Chicago for the last five years. <laughs> But then, if he's already moved on from Haddonfield, what brings him back? Yeah, they kind of root themselves into a corner with the whole family thing. Yeah. They either needed to dump it, or they needed to find a more elegant solution than what they did in the script. It just doesn't quite work. And again, it would be more interesting to focus more on Tommy, or build more of that rival exploration of both Tommy and Dana coming at this situation from two different angles and circling around the drain until they converge. Mm -hmm. There's enough in this script that you could play with and still make a workable script out of it. Oh, yeah. Whereas, again, as I said with Halloween 4, it like had a few ideas, but otherwise you had to burn it to the ground or rebuild it. Pretty much, yeah. It's interesting that we have this whole scene of them playing the family videos while Michael is actually kind of circling around outside, appearing at the windows, knocking on the door. Everyone just kind of brushes it off. But it would have been kind of nice to have like a moment of not necessarily a reaction, but just Michael taking in seeing the footage of himself and Judith's children. Yeah, I could actually see like him do that head tilt as he's looking through the window or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's all you need is just to have him react in some way. Yeah. So, you know, again, they try to talk to Tommy, but it doesn't work out. So then you have the whole thing of the van leaving where Michael has used his cut hand to paint 666 on the Channel 6 <laughs> van. And we find out that they don't even realize that he's driving the van and Andy is dead in a bush. Yeah. Oh, Andy, we knew him so well. Oh, yeah. He was such a great character. I think the only descriptors that he had was in one scene, he was eating a hoagie. And in another scene, he was described as pudgy and bespectacled. <laughs> That's Andy. Oh, classic Andy. Oh, absolutely. I honestly thought when we got introduced to the whole van crew, there's too many characters mm -hmm. here. It feels like they're padding the body count. You don't really send three people out in a news van. You have your reporter and you have the tech guy. The and the tech man. guy will usually yeah. be the one running the camera. They set up the microphones and they drive. Yeah. Or the reporter will do the driving while their tech guy's working on editing in the back. Right. It's usually a much smaller team. You don't need five people. And again, that distracts us from exploring the relationship of Clifton and Dana. Right. They were red shirts. They're just there to pad the body count. So Andy is the first one to go. Well, and within 10 pages, they're all dead. And then well, let's, let's just go ahead and move into the whole sequence in the bog. Yes. What do you think about that? <laughs> I kind of like that Blake creates the found footage genre. <sighs> I actually was kind of surprised, like, oh, they cut away from the action because this writer has kind of leaned almost a little bit too much into the splatterpunk element. And so I was like, oh, that shows a little bit of restraint. And then, of course, we get the found footage mm -hmm. where they find the camera and they play it back and they see it from his perspective. Immediately, the camera does get dropped almost immediately as soon as Michael attacks Blake. Yeah. So you only get the feet and like the screams and all that. So it is a little bit of a modicum of restraint from the writer here. It's not bad, but it's not especially great. It's just there to pad the body count a little bit. You know, we needed a couple more victims. Yeah. It's kind of a drawn out dreary sequence. They pull up in the middle of a bog. These two guys are like, let's go find the other guy. And they walk off. And it's like, well, they haven't shown up again. Let's drive off. Yeah. Oh, look, it's a camera. Oh, that's what happened to them. And then Michael attacks. I like the sequence where she's trapped in the back of the truck and she knows there's a fight going on in the front. And when the car starts driving and she doesn't know who's driving. Right. That's a good sequence. But the thing is, the crew is so disposable that they literally get rid of them all in five pages. It's not an interesting sequence. It's not an interesting location. Most of it's just, and they get dropped in mud and soaking. 
I think a more interesting thing would be a scene where they're in the back of the van talking and they gradually realize it's being driven by someone else as he then starts using the van to terrorize them, like, you know, swerving and all that stuff as they're trying to figure out how to get out of this van that's being driven by Michael Myers. Mm -hmm. So it's like, take that later sequence of the event and make that the whole sequence. Yeah. And Tony and Blake, the camera guy and, what is he, the tech guy or? One's a camera guy, one's a sound guy. Yeah. Their personalities are overlapped too. They're both sarcastic bastards. They're the quipsters. Yeah. Which, if they had more to do, I think that could have been fine. Like, they could have added a little bit of humor to the scenes. But to be honest, I think you could have just done it with one or none if you really wanted, again, focus in on Dana and Clifton. One of my other problems is that I kind of like the way that they have Sheriff Meeker in the story, Mm -hmm. the old sheriff who lost his daughter, but they don't really go with him anywhere beyond that. Right. What if you just had it be that, you know, when they find him in the Myers house, they do the interview with him sitting in the back of the van and as they're doing all this stuff, that's when the van takes off. So he's with them in the van too. And that way then he also gets to play a part in this sequence. Yeah. Because he doesn't really get a payoff. He never has a confrontation with Michael. As far as we know, he's Mm -mm. still just sitting there in the house. (laughs) Yeah. He's like, well, at least it was quiet tonight. The sun comes up. He's like, all right, well, we got through another year. I'm going to head home. And then he sees the news story. He's like, God damn it. (laughs) A chance. (laughs) I think that would have been a way to incorporate him into more of the story. You already have the van pulling up outside the Myers house. You can have the whole Michael killing the driver at that point. Again, this is where you could just move some of the pieces around. You get a good sequence out of it. Mm -hmm. You don't need the bog. You really don't need the bog. You don't need the found footage. You don't need to have that many extra tech people on board. And Henfield doesn't seem like a town that's right on a bog. Especially when it's so close to Chicago. (laughs) Right. That feels like somebody who's just, well, what's something different that I could do? Are you not familiar with those Chicago bogs? <laughs> I've not explored too much of Chicago or the surrounding areas. Maybe there are a lot of bogs that I just never have run across. Are you a north side swamp or a south side bog? <laughs> we'll have to ask Kay about the bogs of Chicago. <laughs> yeah, there you go. The driver thankfully turns out to be Clifton. As they race back to town, Dana shares with him her revelation that she's yet another Myers sister. They try to call Grammy for answers, but Grammy is sitting cold and dead in her living room. Mm -hmm. The car runs into Father Carpenter, who is high as a kite and ranting about brothers and family. Michael suddenly appears, gutting Clifton and crushing the hand of the still-laughing Carpenter. As Dana runs off, we see that Father Carpenter is wearing the cowboy boots of the mysterious Man in Black from Halloween 5. Dun dun dun. Dana hops a ride with some nearby teens and arrives back at the massive Halloween party at the Doyle house. As she drifts in, it's a gaggle of beer, weed, multiple Michaels, and people playing strip poker with serial killer trading cards. Dana makes it to Tommy, sees the bronze soldier he got from Loomis, and tells him everything. According to Tommy, Halloween isn't what drives Michael, it's the bloodline. That said, Halloween is the time when the barriers of nature break down. He shows her the Sam Hain virtual reality game, calling it a digital Ouija board. Hang on, I'm going to try to do my best muttering Paul Rudd from the movie. Halloween is the death of summer. It's a celebration, a festival. A thousand years ago, a time of slaughter, mourning, and breeding. Sort of like Haddonfield on any given Halloween night. I've tried to get there, Dana, to join the party, to see what I can learn. But I can't break through. She has him fire up the game as she dons the headgear. This is so hard not to laugh through this part. (laughs) A cityscape of cemetery headstones leads us back to the druidic altar where a minister is donning a king in the white robes and deer mask of a sacrifice. The king doesn't want to die, but he made a pledge to rule for one year before turning himself over to the gods. The figure is laid on the altar and the high priest plunges his knife down, but something goes wrong. Fissures rip up through the earth and the town starts to burn. Removing the deer mask, the high priest discovers the king had switched places with a bound minister and is now fleeing into the countryside. As the gods fill the countryside with flame, the high priest places a curse on the king's bloodline. On a table by the altar are the pair of bronze soldier figurines. In 1963, we see little Michael Myers trick-or-treating in his clown suit. A fissure appears in the ground, releasing a gas which Michael breathes in. He enters the house and history is made. Then there's a montage of images. Michael's victims, Jamie Lloyd in a cage being prepped for sacrifice, Father Carpenter, Grammy, the king being eaten by wolves, the open glowing trench of Judith Myers' grave. A life-size bronze figure offers Dana a hand and helps her pull out of the program. During all of this, Michael has wandered into the party. He drifts through, taking in the sight of other Michaels and his sister's headstone in the corner. He quietly cuts phone lines, kills Jason Voorhees with a beer bong, and tries to get into the attic, but it's locked with a large steel door. 
Forcing his way through the line waiting for the bathroom, he enters, climbs on the sink, and starts digging up through the ceiling. In the attic, Dana tells Tommy that they need to get Michael to the graveyard during the witching hour, which expires soon as it's already after midnight. They suddenly notice Michael digging his way in and have no avenue of escape because he's barricaded the door. When Michael emerges, Tommy distracts him long enough for Dana to slip away and is only knocked out by the killer as Michael races to pursue. As she drives away, Dana clutches the soldier figurine so hard that it's drawing blood and hallucinates Father Carpenter outside the windows and on the radio. Arriving at the cemetery, Michael is already pursuing her on foot as she dives into the trench over Judith Meyer's grave. Michael jumps in as well, only to discover it's opened into a bottomless hell pit that's sucking him in. He tries to claw his way out, grabbing Dana and pulling her in, but she stabs him in the face with the figurine as he plummets out of sight. Tommy arrives with a group of teens who help him lower Judith's headstone back over the hole. Dana leaves, wanting to go out so she can return to Chicago and file whatever story she can make of this night. As they leave, Tommy suddenly realizes that the witching hour ended 15 minutes ago, meaning they were too late. Sitting on a headstone, Father Carpenter laughs into the night. So let's start with the Father Carpenter twist. Okay. So Father Carpenter, the goofy old preacher from Halloween 4, is now revealed to have been the cowboy boots wearing mysterious man in black stranger in Halloween 5. Mm-hmm. What'd you think of that? I didn't understand why they would have to make that connection, other than they just felt like they wanted to wrap up all the loose ends from Halloween 4 and 5, I guess. Yeah. I didn't care for it. It seems unnecessary. I'm surprised they never had him, like, throw on the trench coat and the hat, but again, that shriveled little old priest from part 4 is supposed to be the hulking man in black from part 5, who was played right. by the same guy who played Michael Myers. To be fair, the whole man in black thing was this whole, they had no answer for it. They just threw it in for whoever did part six to figure out. Mm -hmm. And I can see them again feeling like they're backed in a corner, but this isn't the answer. No. Because again, it still doesn't even explore. Okay, so it's that priest. Why? What's the tie there? What motivated him to be the man in black in part five? Yeah, I don't know. I got the impression that maybe he's related to the high priest that did the curse, but that's just an impression I got. I'm surprised they never out and out said that, given how much they... <laughs> yeah, the, considering they have this whole huge info dump, like at the last 15 minutes of what would have been the film, it seems they would have made a few more connections if they're going to go that route. But like I said, I don't care for that revelation. It just seems like it was unnecessary. They should have saved that and maybe did something with it in a hypothetical part seven or something. Twas ill-conceived. Yeah. <laughs> They're trying something there and it's not working. And again, you know, like they even try to do it where it's like we see a young Father Carpenter in the old family footage, but I don't know what it means. I don't know. Okay, you're putting a lot of pieces on the table, but you don't want to explain how they all go together. That's fine, but I still don't see a way that they could. Right. It's one thing to be vague so that there's multiple possibilities, but I don't see any possibility. That's the difference between being vague and just throwing shit out there. Mm -hmm. If you want there to be like multiple possibilities for a thing, that's cool. Don't tell us which one it is, but there still have to be the possibilities. I don't know what the possibilities are. No. <laughs> I don't know what any of this means, and I don't know why. I, I, don't, I don't get it. It's frustrating. And then like Dana's even starting to hallucinate the priest now, like hearing him on the radio. And then like our final shot is him laughing on a headstone. Yeah. Is he maybe the Halloween god of mischief? <sighs> I wish I knew. I don't know if he was supposed to represent the pagan gods that were yeah. insulted by the lack of sacrifice, or if he's related to the religion that the high priest that put the curse on the family, or maybe they've been keeping an eye on the Myerses ever since. There's just too many possibilities, and in trying to tie your cryptic clues together without actually making anything of substance to tie them together doesn't really do the film or story any benefit. I mean, and to be fair, Halloween 5 ended on such a shitty cliffhanger that created a mess that people had to try to figure out. Like I said, just leave it for 7. The whole mystery of Jamie and the Man in Black, either you have to focus on it and address it, or yeah, leave it for the next person. To its credit, Curse of Michael Myers did take that on and did make the entire story about that. I'm not really fond of how they did it and how they put it together, but at least they did it. Right. This one is just, it's not even have its cake and eat it too. It's like, think of a cake and not want to eat it because you're allergic to it. Yeah. They didn't want to actually tie it up in any satisfying way. Like, they just felt like they were obligated to tie it up in some way. And this was their way. Even if it doesn't make sense, 
I mean, you could have had it be Ben Meeker. You could have had it be a parent who is, oh, yeah, oh, hey, you could have it be that it's like a parent of, well, we already know the sheriff from the first movie. You know, he didn't do that. But who was the parent of the other kids who were killed in the first movie? What if one of them went full on Frank Castle, Hmm. like training himself for the day that he can get revenge on Michael Myers? Go the vigilante route. You know, what if it's like Michael Myers versus the man in black? People are dying left and right, and it's just trying to get everyone out of this feud between these two. Mm -hmm. That's something you could do with the man in black? I would just completely cut out Father Carpenter. Yeah. Either go there or don't go there or don't dance around it. Yeah, we get more explicit supernatural elements other than this, but I think they were wanting to introduce those elements into the story a little bit more explicitly mm-hmm. than they had in the past Halloween films. But again, that's because of the corner they were walked into, but yeah. Right, right. So I don't entirely blame them for that, but it still feels like they wanted to add something creepy old guy who knows more than what he's telling, but it just doesn't pay off. It's so no. frustrating. It's frustrating, yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of what would be the motive for even doing that. Unless it was the producers were like, hey, we have that lingering thing. You have to find a way to do it. Right. It's disappointing that they did it this way. I would just cut the father out entirely. Entirely. He adds nothing to the story. Mm -hmm. It's not a revelation that's worthwhile. It doesn't add anything to the backstory. So what did you think about, hey, they just killed Grammy? I couldn't tell if Michael killed her while he was in the city or if she just died of old age. Right. It's just said that her eyes glazed. Watching the TV, yeah. And they had the shot of the statue to remind you of she that. She saw one too many shots of Pat Sajak. <laughs> Got her blood going and well. They should have just had Michael kill her or something. Like, it just feels a little convenient that she died before she could answer any questions. She was stabbed with all the groceries that Dana bought her. <laughs> Like, she's sitting there with literally, like, a French loaf and a head of lettuce sticking out of her cheese wedge. Yeah, make a joke about how she wants to buy a Val, and then she just sees Michael and screams or something. Ah! She was stabbed by Ovaltine. Yeah. (laughs) Again, if you cut the entire Dana being his relative, you don't even need Grammy in the story. Right, yeah. I love how they keep cementing that Grammy has this gigantic mole on her nose. By the way, do you remember the mole on Grammy's nose? Oh, hey, look, it's Grammy's mole. Yeah, (laughs) it's not exactly subtle. No, no, no. We get to the death of Clifton. Yeah. Which, again, I think would have had more impact had he actually been developed as a character. It's just Clifton is just, he's around. He never really gets built in any interesting way. Yeah, it feels like another draft, he might have been more of an active role. But as he is, he feels like, oh, we still have this guy around. Again, if we wanted to explore more of the philosophical conflict. As you're getting to the third act, you don't need Clifton, because you do want to start to narrow the focus down on Tommy and Dana. Right. They didn't really establish him to the point where you really feel any loss. He saves her by driving the van, and that's a nice little reveal that it's him. But then his death seems kind of perfunctory. If you're going to have this character who's third build as far as like our hero characters mm-hmm. are going, he should have had a more heroic death. Well, I kind of don't mind that whole thing of the car drives away, she doesn't know who's driving, and it turns out to be him, and within another page, he still gets killed by Michael. Yeah. I don't mind that, but again, it doesn't have any impact because we never really developed their relationship enough. You know, even just as friends and coworkers and their competing philosophies of journalism and all stuff, we never really dug deep into that, that we really feel it. Mm-hmm. And then what I kind of love is the way that she gets away from the situation is, hey, some teenagers are getting into a car. Hey, let me in. And they (laughs) they just let her in. And they're like, hey, chill out and take some lithium. Yeah. Oh, those teenagers. And then that brings us back to the party at the Doyle house. So what did you think about all the Halloween party shenanigans at the Doyle house? I do think it's cute Mm -hmm. as an idea to have all these, like earlier on, we saw like a pinhead answer the door when the news team first came to the house. Later on, we get Jason. It's a way of having a soft crossover. There's one moment that I love where it's like, as Dana walks around the room, we see a POV tracking her and we cut to it's Michael Myers watching her from across the room and he takes a puff on a joint because it's just a teenager dressed as Michael Myers. (laughs) It's a nice way of doing the, like, okay, these kids, some of them are going to dress up like Michael Myers, but they don't overly do it like they did in that Halloween 4 Etchison version. It reminds me a lot more of that Halloween 8 scene where Buster Rhymes is dressed as Michael Myers and encounters real Michael Myers. Yeah. Where it's played for amusement. Yeah, it's a nice gag 
That's one thing that the Halloween films haven't really done a whole lot of, is dwell on the Halloween aspect of Halloween. Yeah. Like, that's almost incidental. It's like, that's just the day he kills, but they don't really focus in on the actual holiday that much. It's like they'll touch on it. Yeah. And this is a nice way to do that, to touch on it without it being the focus. I almost think if we didn't need to go elsewhere for the third act, you could have just kept this as a location for the third act and have it be an entire Halloween party that's been infiltrated by Michael Myers. Because I actually really like a lot of this stuff, where it's just mm-hmm. kids just doing their thing and having fun, not even realizing that there's this killer in their midst that he's quietly cutting the phone lines, that he's not even creating chaos. He still has his target. He's just kind of wading through all this. I love the one thing that he does is kill the kid dressed as Jason Voorhees by like overly pumping a beer pong down his throat. <laughs> but even then, I love the joke of that guy passes out and everyone just thinks he's drunk and killed the keg. So there's nothing left to drink. Yeah. And I like that he sees the gravestone of Judith. And he's not pleased by it, but he doesn't do anything about it. Right. You just see him reaction shot, which I could actually see like that head tilt, tightening the grip on his yeah. knife or something. Nothing so overt as like yeah. just stabbing people, but it's a nice little way of showing like a little bit of like motivation or rage on his part, which is something that the script could have maybe used a little bit more of. If you kept this as the location of the third act and you have the moment where everything suddenly turns into a nightmare, yeah, you could just incorporate that into he does something involving the tombstone. Right. All this stuff with Michael at the party is great. I'm perfectly on board with this. This is the type of stuff that I want this script to keep and keep building on. Mm -hmm. I love bits where it's like, yeah, you get a bunch of kids just sitting there playing strip poker with their serial killer cards and they just look up and there's Michael Myers in the door where he just walks on. (laughs) Yeah. I almost want to think that Michael is almost slightly amused by this because that was the thing I loved about that Buster Rhyme scene in Halloween Resurrected was where Buster Rhyme shows up dressed as Michael Myers, tells Michael Myers he missed his mark, berates him and tells him to get off the set and go do something else. And Michael Myers doesn't kill him. Michael Myers literally just turns and walks away. You can tell Michael Myers is like, I did not expect to run into this. Let's see what happens if I do something else. Well, and we discussed this when we were doing Longbox Carpentry. Yeah. Like One of the things that we always appreciated that they did in the first film and a lot of the later films got away from was Michael Myers has a little bit of a sense of humor. Like, he yeah. likes to do these tableaus and things just to, like, mess with you. Yeah, you can see him plotting as he goes along. And they kind of got away and they just made him into a more of a Jason Voorhees. Yeah. Just something that just keeps killing without any style other than just what's the most convenient thing to stab with. If we want to do this where we're restructuring the story, you still have the same setup. He's homeless in Chicago. He sees the news story about how they decided to lift the ban on Halloween in Haddonfield. He's like, you know what? I've been wandering around for too long. Time to head back home, see what's what, and see what I can make of it. And just have it be that he's drifting through this rebuilding of Halloween, and he's literally rebuilding himself, you know, getting fresh clothes, getting a fresh mask, getting a fresh knife. As this town is reforming itself to Halloween again, he's literally reforming himself back to the classic shape. And it all culminates in this big party where he is enjoying the atmosphere. He is a part of the atmosphere. He's drifting through it. And then he springs his plan into motion and turns it into a nightmare. Right. That's the Michael I like. I like the Michael where it's not all perfectly planned. He's an opportunist where it's like, oh, hey, that person looks interesting. Let me see what I can do with them. Mm -hmm. That's the Michael I like. Yeah, I agree. I like a little bit when he's willing to put a little preparation into it, like the Joker. It is. Yeah, he's exactly like the Joker. He just doesn't laugh. He just displays. Yeah, he's got a lot of plans in motion, but he's also willing to just completely go off book and just do something different depending on how things roll out. Yeah, where it's amazing what you can do with a few bucks in gasoline, you know? Uh Uh-huh. That's the Michael I like. The Michael where he himself has this kind of mischievous, making it up as he goes along edge to him. Mm -hmm. That's my biggest problem with the new film is that they don't do that. There's a few moments that made me think of that. Moments. Yeah, but they're not as much as I would have liked. He seems more like he's just on kill mode. Literally going house to house. Yeah. But back to this one. I love, I love the bit where it's like Michael goes up to the attic, finds that it's like this giant steel door that he can't do anything about. So he has to replan. And he pushes himself through the line of teenagers who are waiting for the bathroom, shoves kids out of the bathroom and just starts digging his way up through the ceiling. Mm -hmm. As all these teenagers are just like, but hey, man, you're cutting in line. Like he even throws out like a couple of teenagers who are necking in the bathroom. It's like, he's not killing everyone. They're not who he's here for. No. And then I also love the whole thing of, so he closes the bathroom door, digs up to the ceiling. And then from those teenagers perspective, then suddenly the door opens up again and it's Dana. Well, okay, I don't know what happened there, but bathroom's free. And then I love that when Michael jumps down through the hole, you hear the scream of a teenager who's using the bathroom. (laughs) Oh, I want that shot of just, yeah, a girl on the toilet as Michael Myers drops through the (laughs) ceiling. It'd just be hilarious. Uh Uh-huh. I like this sequence. I really do. Yeah. 
there's a lot of this script I don't have a problem with. And this Mm -hmm. is a sequence that I actively really enjoy. So it's like, if we could have a lot more of the script like this, or building off of what was done here, I'd be fine with that. So I suppose we should transition to the part that we don't like so much. So JD, Uh what do you think about Lawnmower Man 3, Sam Hain's world? (laughs) Uh... This leaves me with a lot more questions as answers. How does Tommy get a virtual reality Ouija board is how they describe it. Yes. That is never explained. (laughs) Why does it have to be virtual reality? Why does it let him see things in the past and what's going on in the present? Yes. Like he's visiting the party downstairs. There's just so many questions and it's just glossed over. It felt like somebody had seen Lawnmower Man and they were like, let's do that. And admittedly, like, it's early to mid-90s. That was a big trend at the time. Everyone thought that was going to be the new tech, going to change everything. And they're just starting to now do it today. But it's just so bizarre. Like, it has not (laughs) aged well at all. Yeah. I'm sure, like, at the time it would have been silly. But now it is just an extra layer of, oh my god, what the fuck. Because 1994 virtual reality technology allowed you to just conjure up whatever you wanted to see as you're trying to solve the actual riddles of what happened in the past. Mm Mm-hmm. And admittedly, like, a lot of the 90s had technology as magic things where I've heard of the internet. I guess we can just say it lets us find city schematics on a regular, like, GeoCities website or something. But again, every single thing that we see still in digital entertainment is something that someone had to program and put there. Right. You can't just conjure things. No. You don't have a time window. It's almost like it sends them on a psychic vision. Yeah. But it doesn't work that way. I'm okay with the science not necessarily making sense. No, no, no. But even then, it's a really shitty way to dump this info. Again, you don't need this backstory. You don't need the backstory. And if you did have the backstory, you don't need the complication of adding virtual reality to explain it. A flashback would have been better. It's all the problems I had with Curse of Michael Myers and the Cult of the Thorn, plus shitty virtual reality. Right. Ugh. Okay, you want to take this whole thing of, okay, there was a high priest, there was a king, the king was supposed to be sacrificed. That was the promise that he made to the gods, that if they let him rule for one year, he would let himself be sacrificed. He instead switched places and they sacrificed someone else, and the gods were angry and they burned the entire town. And before he died, the high priest placed a curse on the family line of the king. And that family line, if you look at these chains, it traces all the way back up to the Myers family. And it's like, you could literally have all that information delivered exactly the way I just said it through Tommy as a conspiracy theory rant and have Dana just be kind of sitting there like, what? (laughs) Yeah. And you could, again, build a funny scene around it that's telling your story while also embracing how ridiculous it is. I mean, in a way that's like full on, you know, the History Channel, it's Aliens guy. Yeah, like you don't have to accept it as the gospel of the Halloween universe. It would perfectly fit as a theory being had by this version of Tommy. Right. He is so obsessed with, you know, the whole wall of connections and it's aliens, you know, basically that type of guy. If he just poured this all out as a monologue and she would just be like, I don't know about that, but my grandma was his grandma. Yeah. And then a funny take would be like him going like, I knew it. Instead of the ending that we get, it kind of leaves a little bit more of an open question as to like whether or not Michael will come back or whatever. Yeah. If you had to have that ending, if that was locked in stone, like at least that would make it a yeah. little bit more of a question mark as opposed to, oh, well, they fucked up. So we know he's going to be coming back. Even though I'm coming up with ways that I believe you could do this better. I would still cut all the shit. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know what? Okay, the whole backstory involving the king and the high priest and all that stuff, have that come earlier when Tommy is first talking to Dana and they're having a conversation, getting a sense of each other. And again, play it as this little aside conspiracy theory rant. Don't play it as the truth. Just play it as what my research has shown me that I believe. And she's just kind of like, no. Yeah. Don't have it be the answer. Just have it be this kind of momentary bit. Mm -hmm. Again, you don't need to have an origin for Michael Myers other than he's a kid who went bad. And never stopped being a bad kid. Yeah. And that's really all you need. I do agree. I don't think Michael needs an origin. I think trying to give him one just limits him. Mm -hmm. You don't need the Dana backstory. You don't need to cross those streams. You don't need the virtual reality. Yeah. Once they introduced that whole family element, and it wasn't a bad idea necessarily, but but it limited the scope of what they could do with it going down the road. Because like you say, you just start having Michael go through every single branch of the family tree, which case it's just kind of like, okay, I don't really care about any of these people anymore. You know, Laurie Strode's third cousin twice removed. Why should I care? You know, and that's the only route they could have gone other than explore 
like what made Michael evil. If this is the answer they had, I don't want that either. You have the seeds here that you can do. Michael finds out the town is bringing back Halloween. He's drawn back in by that. He becomes more his old self as the town becomes more Halloween. And then it all culminates in him coming across this giant Halloween party. That's all you need for the plot of this movie. Mm -hmm. And you can have all these other stuff build around it. You don't need to overcut. This is overcomplicating itself. It's overthinking itself. Mm -hmm. It's falling into all the traps that you don't want to fall. It's falling into the same traps that the actual curse of Michael Myers did, where it desperately overthought the backstory to the point where the actual plot it was telling was not that interesting. Yeah. That makes me think that a lot of this is coming from the Akkads. Yeah. Like we said, we've really enjoyed the script for 70, 80% of yeah. it, other than, yeah, some of the horror bits could have been polished a little bit better but the actual like story and pacing and everything yeah. was fine and then you get to this end it feels shoehorned in it doesn't feel congruous with the rest of the script it just feels like somebody was told we have to have an origin it has to have these elements that we've set up in the other films with yeah. sam hain not Sawin, even though it's how you say it oh shush all these elements that they've built up from the second film on and they just threw it in a blender and this is what came out. Yeah. I don't want to say even more so than the one they actually made. I mean, the thing is, I enjoy more of this script than I enjoy the Dennis Farrans one that they filmed. Yeah. The parts of this script that are bad are bad, but the parts that are good are good. It peaks and valleys a lot more than the Halloween 6 we got. Because the Halloween 6 we got, it's not good, but it's kind of forgettable, to be honest. The one we got is bad with moments of okay. Yeah, no. It could have been really good. It could have been fine. No, I don't agree with you that the Curse of Michael Myers. Curse of Michael Myers needed a lot more work to become good. Well, I, I was meaning this one. It could have been good. Oh, yeah, no, no. And then it just shoots itself in the foot. Again, the majority of this script is good. Yeah. That's the biggest thing I got to say for it. The majority of this script is good, and the parts that are bad are stuff that it could survive having cut out. Mm -hmm. It's a script that it wouldn't take that much to fix. No. So, and again, we're starting to drift into final thoughts, but we still have a graveyard sequence. Oh, yes, we do. This ultimately builds up to the graveyard where they have to lure Michael Myers into the trench of Judith Myers' headstone, which is now a bottomless hell pit trying to suck him down, which they only have a specific unit of time, of now human quantified measured time, because that's how the supernatural works, oh, yeah. in order to get him in this hole. Especially a thousand years ago when they had very precise clocks. Yes, yes, you can't be off by 14 minutes. Yep. Despite the fact that the time it would have taken them to bring the truck with the headstone on it back over the graveyard and lower the headstone down with winches would have probably taken that 14 minutes. So Michael would have already been in the hole. Look, we don't need your facts and logic. Plus, the characters have some dialogue exchanges. So it's like they're spending yeah. those 14 minutes doing other things. It doesn't make sense. And the ending itself, getting sucked down into the vortex, that feels like a Freddy thing. It doesn't feel like a Michael Myers thing. It's too overtly supernatural. When Jason has done it. Yeah, which I didn't like that. Wasn't that the end of, was it Jason Goes to Hell, where he gets sucked down and around, like, you know, then the glove comes up and gets the mask? Yeah, and I didn't like that then either. To be fair, they said Jason was going to hell and he went to hell. <laughs> That's true. They should have titled this one Halloween 666. He gets sucked into a trench. <laughs> I don't like that much over supernatural spookums in my Michael Myers films. Even if this were a supernatural series, it's a weak ending. Yeah, it's something where like, okay, it doesn't really make sense that you could shoot Michael in the eyes and he's still up and running four or five films later. But at least it keeps it mysterious. This is just so in your face. It's just too much. It all just fell apart. Mm -hmm. Again, like building the whole last 30 pages around that Halloween party and him turning it to hell and them having to confront him there without the backstory, without the origins, without the supernatural. You would still have to come up with a satisfying climax, which I don't have off the top of my head, but I would still be more interested to see what you would have built out of that. What if you pushed the Judith Meyer headstone over on him? Yeah, I, to be honest, I kind of thought they might. That's the ultimate payoff is he gets knocked to the ground and they push the headstone on top of him. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't kill him, but it's got him pinned. And then they could bury him or something. No, you don't even need that. Just, that's when the cops show up. Yeah. And then they take him to jail and then the man in black can appear and kill all the cops and take him. No. <laughs> Let's not do that. That'd be silly. I would end the movie with Michael Myers getting arrested, where I think part five should have just stopped. Yeah. That is a more intriguing cliffhanger of, well, where do we build the next one off of? Mm -hmm. well, and then they kind of answered that with the new one. But <laughs> Yeah. And then, yeah, the whole thing of, yeah, we didn't make it on the witching hour. And then the whole final exchange between Tommy and Dana is just, I'm going back home. I've got a story to file. Yeah. That's just a weak final line. This film's burned out by now. Yeah. 
So, AG. Yes. Any final thoughts? Like we've said, this is almost a good, definitely not great. I don't think it could have been great, even with a few polishes. Uh, good's fine. Good's fine. Yeah, it would have been fine or good. You polish up the horror bits, the kills and everything. You take out the origin part and Dana's relationship to Michael. It would have been fine. It would have been good. It's not. It's close. It's so frustrating, perhaps more so than the last script we reviewed, because Halloween 4 was such a mess. There's nothing you really could do other than just laugh at it. You couldn't save it. Yeah, which is the only reason why I kind of wanted to see that film. (laughs) This one, I kind of want to see this film. But if there is a hypothetical universe that I could visit where this was made, I think I'd still be frustrated because the ending is just not there. And that's really like the biggest problem with it. It's just take out that ending, rework it. Like you said, like have it be the last act all takes place at the party, have the tombstone fall on him, pin him to the ground, crush him, whatever. That would have been fine. As it is, it's a mess of an ending. God, I just had a thought. You shouldn't have those. I've warned you. You talk about how they brought back Halloween for the new generation of kids. Mm -hmm. What if it's like a whole bunch of kindergartners versus Michael Michael, (laughs) who use their plucking youth and daring do to like full on monster squat him down? I kind of want to write that film now. I don't know I would do that for this movie, but I want that movie. I was going to say, like, you don't have to have Michael Myers. You could just have kids versus serial killer. It's a whole busload of Kevin McAllister's versus Michael Myers. All right, copyright Noel and JD. <laughs> Halloween alone. <laughs> Lost in Haddonfield. It's frustrating because you can see there's a good movie in this. Mm-hmm. You can see it, and it's a good movie that it wouldn't take much to get to. And that's the other thing is, I would love to know, who is Phil Rosenberg? If he ever hears this, I'd love to hear if he had any history on this. Did they ever do another draft? Did they ever sit down and try to work stuff out? Or was it basically this got submitted and was tossed out? Yeah. I would have rather reworked this script and kept seeing what this could grow into than use the actual script they filmed for Halloween 6. Right. Yeah, I think we've pretty much covered everything else. Yeah, drop the supernatural, drop the VR, drop the backstory, drop Father Carpenter. (laughs) And you drop all that, yeah, you drop 30 pages out of the script, but what's left is a good script. No, it's not fantastic, but it's good. Yeah. It's good. Rework the death scenes, rebuild that void. It wouldn't take that much to fill that void up again. No. In that extra space you could have used to flesh out the characters more. Again, that's where you could really expand on Dana as a character. You could explore her and Clifton, their philosophical views over covering the story more interestingly. You could drop the camera crew and make it more about her and Clifton. You could have more of a build between her and Tommy and what this whole return to Halloween means to this town. It's a film that you can make more thematically interesting. All those themes are already here. They're already on the page. It would just be cool to build them up a little bit more and then try to find a way of how can we maintain those themes while also telling an interesting story. Yeah. While still keeping it entertaining and fun. Expanding the Halloween party would make for a better third act. Reworking some of the kills. You could tighten them up, have less of them, but spread them out more throughout the story. One of the things I loved in the first film was his looming presence, Mm -hmm. where he's just in the background. It's not dwelled on too much. You don't have to have a kill every single time he's on screen. This film feels like if he's on screen, he needs to be killing somebody. If you went that route where you go from the homeless terror Michael Myers to the more classic image of the shape, to have him come and re-evolve himself back to that while he is literally going about and taking in the sight of this town that's learning how to Halloween again. While we're also having our lead characters exploring this story and this debate about, can we Halloween again? Mm -hmm. There's a really interesting movie in this. And so I don't fault the screenwriter for not getting it right on the first try. No. I fault the producers for not continuing to develop the parts that work. Yeah. And like I said, I have a feeling that the Akkads pushed a lot of these, especially the origin elements. Because they do go back to a lot of these things that we don't like in this script are the things that we don't like in the actual film that was made. The parallels between this film and the one they made probably came out of the same studio notes. We want Tommy to become the new Loomis. We want to explore the Druidic origins. We want to wrap up the Man in Black. Mm -hmm. We can tell that those were requirements. I still don't think either one of them succeeded in fulfilling those requirements. No. I think the finished film, or at least the producer's cut, did a better job of fulfilling those requirements while telling a terrible story. This one didn't fulfill those requirements, but told a better story. Though I think Tommy is... The great thing I love is that Tommy's good in both of them. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like this version of Tommy a lot more than the Halloween 4 version that we talked about last time. Yeah. Oh, man, that Halloween 4. Yeah, that was a mess. 
So we are here to discuss yet another draft of Halloween 666 The Origin, this time now known as Halloween 666 The Origin of Michael Myers, though I will ask you, JD, was there an actual origin in this story? Uh, like, maybe if you squint. Obtusely? Yeah, but no, not really. A portal did it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll get into it more. But yeah, we recorded that episode on the previous drafts of Halloween 666 months ago. And then lo and behold, yet another completely unrelated draft surfaces. That original one by Phil Rosenberg was again written in 1994, just one month later in May of 1994. Here we have yet another draft by a new pair of writers. And then ultimately we ended up on Dennis Ferranza's Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers. This one was written by Irving Belatech and Lawrence Gooderman, who were two students who were just coming out of film school. I did not write down which film school, I don't really care, where they had worked together on a number of shorts. Belatech did his writing and directorial debut with the short film called Saving Souls in 1995 after this script, and he wouldn't make his first feature until the 1999 thriller Implicated, which I'm sure you remember that one, right, J.D.? I resent the implication that I remember implicated. Exactly, and wouldn't make another film for about another 14 years when he wrote another thriller called Cold Spring, and then in 2014 became a writer on the Tom and Jerry show. Oh, okay. And that's it. Lawrence Gooderman, on the other hand, is a bit more of a known name. He got his debut in 1994 with a short film called Headless, which was his student short, which caught the attention of Steven Spielberg, hmm. who hired him to become a sequence director for chunks of the DreamWorks animated film Ants. Oh, I remember Ants. Yeah. And then while that was in production in 1996, Gooderman also directed the video game Goosebumps Escape from Horrorland, which was one of those kind of full motion video PC adventures. Mm. And in 2001, he made his directorial feature with the children's film Cats and Dogs, where it was like cats and dogs have this whole secret espionage war against each other. Yeah, I never watched it, but I remember the trailers. I had seen it. It's, it's actually quite a charming, fun adventure. It's silly as hell, but it's Jim oh, Henson yeah. Studios doing puppets of real dogs and cats, where wearing, like, high-tech James Bond gear. <laughs> and it's like Nathan Lane is the evil cat mastermind. Yeah. And then, notoriously, he followed this up by directing his only other feature film, the 2005 film Son of the Mask. Oh. Where Jamie Kennedy took over the franchise of The Mask, and it didn't go over well. Yeah. And since then, he's directed episodes of Out of Jimmy's Head and Mongo Wrestling Alliance, which are just kind of fun kid shows. But he has not directed anything since 2011, despite having a number of credits on IMDb that are perpetually in production. Not the most successful pair to give a Halloween script to. Kind of explains some of the weird tonal things that happen in it. Yeah. Because it does read like a cartoon, but we'll get there. <laughs> yeah. Before we start breaking down the story, I just want to ask, J.D., did you recommend this screenplay? And would you like to have seen it filmed? No, not really. Parts of it are retreads of the other 666 script we read. Yeah. And the new bits, they don't really add anything to the mythos. The characters are flat. The horror action is, again, like you implicated, is cartoonish. It's not very good. No. Yeah. The actual prose of the writing is nice. I'll give them yeah, that. <laughs> I'll give them that. It was an easier script to read than a lot of the other ones we've covered. Oh, God, yes. But it's not really describing anything of value. It's just such a thin story. The characters are thin. The kills are just weirdly flat. Michael Myers is just a non-entity just mauling around in this one. There's no origin in the film called The Origin, the virtual reality stuff. It's just even the whole idea of Tommy and Loomis running around as like a mentor and young adventurer, just it falls flat. It's just it's a very flat script. It's like the only thing that I really enjoyed was just how cartoonishly over top of an antagonist Sabrina was. Yeah. And her gigantic orgy of a party. It's like that was like when it, things became interesting because it just went so over the top. Mm -hmm. Like we're going to stone a guy with my pet rocks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We'll get into that. Oh, yeah. But it's like, I want to take her and that whole chunk of the third act and, like, stick it in another movie. But the rest of it is just flat. It's bland. It's not very thrilling. The story isn't put together very well. It's not even a very compelling story. Mm -mm. It's just, it doesn't work. It just does not work at all. No. 
So, let's dive into the first chunk. Let's do it. Our opening credits play over a montage of the Myers house, spending years rotting away, being vandalized by neighboring children for its history, and then Jake Ferguson and his teenage daughter Dana move to town, buy the house, and begin restoring and rebuilding it. As Halloween approaches, Jake plunks a jack-o'-lantern right in front of his new home. The only thing that was missing was, like, a kid, like, running by and, like, punting it. <laughs> <laughs> in a dilapidated sanitarium where the orderlies are too focused on a game of cards to care about their patients, one man has lied in a coma in a room for five years. The man is suddenly approached by the Stranger, the man from Halloween 5 in a duster and cowboy boots, who gives him an injection, then retreats. The man wakes up, turning out to be Michael Myers, who kills all of the orderlies. Cut back to Haddonfield, where Dana is having a difficult time settling in amongst her peers, all of whom are suspicious of the girl living in the Myers home. The head antagonist is Sabrina the Teenage Bitch, the coldest, most beautiful girl in school, who's dating football star Johnny while also sleeping with an entire cadre of guys who frequently follow her around, along with her army of Heathers. She's dedicated herself to making Dana miserable, largely because Dana has caught Johnny's eye. None of this is helped by Dana's father Jake, now being a janitor at their school, nor her own feelings of loss that she had to uproot from her friends and plans to now spend her senior year with strangers. Also a frequent target of Sabrina's clan is Tommy Doyle, whose home is the rented-out garage of Sabrina's family. He's nicknamed Too Slow, not just because he putters around on a snail of a moped, but because the emotional traumas from that Halloween night back in 1978 slowed down his development growing up. Now he divides his time between playing virtual reality games where he gets to save princesses from evil knights and protesting out on the streets that Haddonfield has decided to reinstate Halloween after a years-long ban. Upon learning new people have moved back into the Myers house, he tries his best to warn Dana, but his awkward approaches keep being interpreted as threats. I think we'll just kind of stop there. So what do you think about the whole concept of a new family buying and trying to restore the Myers house? That's not a bad idea. It's better than holding a reality TV show in that house. So I will give it points How for that. dare you? Um, but <laughs> it's fine. It's a classic trope. Family moves into the house that they shouldn't move into because bad economy. So dad has to take whatever he can get. Would think that apartment would be cheaper if you're not working. Whatever. It's fine. As far as like the thing that gets the ball rolling, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's elements that I like. I like that idea. I like it more than what they ultimately did in Halloween 6. It was just the Strode family is stuck in that house because they're a realty company that can't sell it. And that's the one that they're stuck with. A realty company would have just cut their losses on that house. Yeah. Years ago. <laughs> It's not a bad concept. I actually like that they opened it up as a montage because we've had montages with jack-o'-lanterns. I think 2018 did that whole opening montage of like the rotted pumpkin restoring itself in reverse. And it's an interesting concept of let's take the Myers house, this dilapidated wreck covered in graffiti, windows all busted in, kids messing with it all the time. And this new family comes in and starts restoring it. Problem is, is like if you're so low income that you're going to buy a place super cheap, you're not going to be able to afford to restore it. Because that costs money. Yeah, it depends on how super cheap it was. Yeah. A lot of people do that. They'll restore a house and flip it. Well, it depends on how much work needs to be put into it. Well, yeah, but these people aren't flippers. They're trying to make this their new home. Right. But you can make something livable even if you don't have a whole lot of money. But it is a lot of work. And like I said, in an apartment, it would be a yeah. lot cheaper. And yeah, you're not going to get any money back yeah. from it when you move out. Well, especially when you're going to be working all day as a janitor, too. You know, right. it's, you're not going to be able to put the time in to do that restoration. And we later learned like he was like a civil engineer or something like that. Yeah. So he, he was applying for a job the next town over or something like that. Yeah. So the janitor job was just temporary. So I'm like, why would you get a house? Buy a house for a temp job. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Other than just to have an excuse to revisit the Myers house. Yeah. It doesn't quite make sense, but it's like, otherwise, I like that montage. I like this sense of just someone who's new to this town. I kind of like the idea of, well, well, let me just ask you first. What do you think about, like, Dana as this character who's now been kind of uprooted from her life and placed in this new one that's instantly hostile? I will say just about every character here is pretty flat, and Dana is no exception. She's not bad, though. I mean, I kind of see the appeal of, it's very much a horror trope of the shy girl who's not as slutty as the other girls. One thing that really didn't make sense for me was why everyone was so hostile towards her because she moved during her senior year. Yeah. I've never heard of that being a thing. Yeah. People move all the time. I know that maybe you may not choose to do that if you had a choice, but that's not unusual. Maybe in a small town, but I just didn't buy it. 
Yeah, I wish they had framed it more about she's in the Myers house. I mean, we kind of get that with, like, the kids that are always standing outside. They're like, Myers gonna get you, Myers gonna get you. But it's like, Sabrina's hostility is, who does this person think they are coming to my school in their senior year when this is supposed to be my senior year? It's like, what the fuck? Yeah. But if it's just, oh, that's the girl who moved into the Myers house, so I can have fun with this. You know, that's all the motivation you need. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, she's not a bad character. I mean, we see her occasionally be inquisitive and we learn a little bit of her background, like she was into writing and Mm -hmm. stuff like that, but there's not any meat there. Like, it's just all surface details. She's just kind of a bland, kind of shy girl. The typical girl next door. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nothing really notable about her that would make her stand out as the main heroine of the story. Yeah, so let me just go ahead and ask, what do you think about Sabrina? Oh, God. She... (laughs) Sabrina and the rest of the Mean Girls seem like a parody of Mean Girl cliches, but without any self-awareness to actually have anything to say about the Mean Girl cliche. Well, Heathers had already been out for like eight years at this point. So. Yeah, but still. This sir is no Heathers. Yeah. If you're going to have a character this over the top, like this bitchy, just having guys wrapped around her finger and just doing whatever she wants because she's the queen bitch. Without having anything to add to that, it just comes off as a gross caricature of a high school girl and without any substance to her to make... I could see, like, maybe she starts off that way and maybe she and Dana have to team up at the end because they're the only ones who are alive. But that's not where the story goes. She's just there to be a giant bitch. She is so over the top of a caricature that she feels like a Rob Zombie character. Uh, Kind of, (laughs) yeah. But I mean, to be fair, she was the most entertaining part of the script just because of how over the top she went. And it's not that shocking to find out that both of these writers went on to do very cartoony things later, like The Mask or Tom and Jerry. Right. Because her stuff is just so ridiculously out there. And yet I found that so enjoyable. But part of that was just because the rest of the script was so flat and dull. (laughs) Yeah. I at least appreciated that. Oh, they were having fun there. Yeah, if this was a better script, you would be rolling your eyes because of how over the top she is. Not really, because I like things. Are, I mean, that's what Heather's is. <laughs> Heather's is that character and other people deciding, let's kill Heather. You know? Yeah. <laughs> You know, that's what Mean Girls is. But, you know, Mean Girls at least got to more character beneath it. Yeah. But yeah, it's reveling in the unredeemable qualities of this character. Yeah, I will grant you that. And then just kind of right off the bat, did you have any thoughts? Are you capable of having any thoughts of Johnny? Uh, no, not really. Like, I kind of wanted to like him because he was being somewhat humane as opposed to all the other teenage characters who weren't Dana. But there was not any depth to it. He just seemed to like her because he thought she was cute. So he was being nice to her. And that's about it. So I'm like, this guy's got an agenda. Even if he's being nice, he's just trying to get into her pants or something. And I know that's not actually text in the script, but that's the only reason I could think of why he would be like that. Because otherwise he's hanging out with a crowd that is horribly classist. Garish and over the top. Yeah. He just seems like the odd fit otherwise. I'm betting it's like he saw her and it's like, she looks grounded and normal. I could use some of that in my life. And maybe that's it. And maybe like a good actor, if they were handed the script, could maybe bring some of that onto the screen. Oh, I had Jeremy London stuck in my head, unfortunately. Oh, I'm sorry. (laughs) Not to say Jeremy London is terrible, but he's Jeremy London. Yeah. I get the concept of it, that he's drawn to her and he's stuck with Sabrina because Sabrina is the exciting, charismatic person who also wants to sleep with him because he's a star football player and that boosts up her public image. But Sabrina is also so open about all of her machinations and the entire group of guys that she frequently sleeps with behind his back and her whole army of her her cult of followers. Let's go ahead and call him a cult of followers. Mm -hmm. How is he not aware of any of this? Because she's doing it all fully in the open. I didn't even get that she was with Johnny. I thought she was with Derek right, and the, he was just part of the group. And Billy and... No, she was with Johnny, but she was sleeping with one of the other guys. It was either Eric or Derek or whatever. She was sleeping with one of the guys, and then the big shock is when the third guy opens the door and finds out that she's sleeping with the second guy. And it's like, we're supposed to be shocked by this. All of her female friends know about all of this, and she's like, again, doing it all right in the open, and all of the men just seem to be deluded, thinking that they're the important ones in her life. And it's like, how is that working? Well, and all the characters that weren't Sabrina or Dana, as far as, like, the teenage cast kind of blended together for me. 
They're just the cult, yeah. Some of them get names, but they get no lines. Laura seems like the only other one that seems to have some of her own agency because she seems to be the second in command of the yeah. bitch squad. But even then, she's just a lighter version of Sabrina. Almost all of the descriptions are like the perky redhead, the perky brunette. Yeah. Eric has a tan. Or Tina, <laughs> who has a bad nose job. Yes. That was a description that was needed. Mm-hmm. It doesn't add anything to her character. Right. Nobody comments about her nose in the script. I think they wanted to have a way of distinguishing characters. That was the best they could come up with. Yeah. I understand why they're trying to give her a love interest, because you can't have Tommy be her love interest because he's 27 and she's a teenager. Yeah, I was worried about that. The finished film did a better job of this by she's in her 20s in college, who is a single mother living in the Myers house, and that's why she's a social reject. Yeah. And that way you can have a relationship with Tommy while also being sneered at by your peers by being stuck in the Myers house and because you're a single mother who had to leave town for a couple of years. Right. So it's like that all at least makes sense. Mm-hmm. Not that they ever explored any of that in The Curse of Michael Myers, but at least they had that set up down. Mm-hmm. And then also that, oh, her dad is the janitor at the school. Like, oh, I saw that twist. I didn't, actually. I, for whatever reason, I just didn't put that together. I should say I saw where they were going to go with it once that twist happened. Yeah, that makes sense. I actually kind of like that part because, you know, that adds to the awkwardness of, oh, you just moved to a new school and, oh, by the way, your dad's the janitor. No, I get it, but that doesn't gel with also you just bought a house that you're trying to restore. Oh, yeah. You can't do that when you're working all day as a janitor. It's just these two things don't fit together. No. The only way you could justify it is if they had a lot in savings, but he ran out of work, and so they spent all their savings to get the house, which is just a bad choice Mm -hmm. financially to make. It doesn't make sense, but there is a kind of a sweetness to Jake. Yeah, no, he's a perfectly likable dad, but there's not much that he gets to do. Yeah, there's not any depth there, like any of these characters, really. Spoiler alert, I don't like the characters. Spoiler alert, there's nothing there to like or dislike. They're just <laughs> <Yeah>. there. <laughs> but he's fine. I like the twist of that would be awkward and that would be something like a teenage girl would have to deal with, would cause some social issues as far as having your class make fun of you or whatever. Like that makes some sense. And I think it's something I didn't see him working as a janitor when they first started. That was a kind of a pleasant surprise as far as like, oh, this could go somewhere interesting. It really doesn't, but it's fine. Serviceable. So what did you think about Too Slow Tommy? Tommy, it feels a lot like the Tommy we saw in the other 666. Mm -hmm. And also to the degree of the Paul Rudd version. To be honest, I kept picturing Paul Rudd when I read the script. Well, one thing I should mention is that while these are three separate scripts... You can definitely tell they had at least some notes in place of like, we want this in the story. And I think the idea of Tommy, the idea of virtual reality was just kind of devolved into just he has a computer in the final film and things have to be set around the Myers house. Mm -hmm. You can see that similar through line of just they had some ideas they wanted all the scripts to hit on. Yeah, I have a feeling that the Akkads or somebody in charge was saying like, I want to see this. And Mm -hmm. so each writer kind of did their own version of that. And I kind of like the idea of Tommy being developmentally challenged because of the PTSD, therefore not getting along with anyone very well. But the whole virtual reality thing is just silly and really doesn't add anything to the script. And it just basically becomes a MacGuffin later on, much like the other script did. Yeah. To be honest, I think I liked Earl the Iguana a little bit more than I liked (laughs) any other character. His pet iguana. Because it's the iguana. It's cute. And I, I like the idea that Tommy, that's probably his best friend, is that he's got a little pet iguana. And that his pet iguana that likes to nibble on sugary cereals. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a good way to get a dead pet iguana. <laughs> yeah, probably. I've not really had a problem with the concept of Tommy or bringing back Tommy through any of the three versions of Halloween 6. I think if you're going to bring him back, yeah, just have him be that damaged kid who's now grown into kind of a paranoid adult who's just kind of like, stop bringing back Halloween and Michael Myers. You know what happens? Why do you keep doing this to yourself, people? Who nobody listens to, and he's kind of a loser. I think that's a good way to have a new generation of the Loomis character without just having him be Loomis. Right. To have that new generation of who can be your through line through the movies, who can be your person to be your recurring protagonist, who's not always going to be the lead character, but will always be this recurring supporting figure. I think Tommy's not a bad way to go. Right. I don't dislike the concept of Tommy in any of these three versions. The virtue reality thing makes no sense. I don't want to say it makes more... It's not as... No, it's every bit as nonsensical as it was in the last script. But, I mean, the last script was the whole, 
recreating the druidic rituals and all that stuff. And this one, I like that his introduction is now he's just playing a game where he's saving a princess from a knight. You know, he's literally just using it as a video game. Right. Later on in the story, it becomes nonsense. It's still not really adding anything. No, I mean, and this was like a couple years after Lawnmower Man. So I think that that was just yeah. somebody trying to write a trend that they thought was going to be big with kids and wasn't. Oh, yeah. There was that whole VR boom. Mm-hmm. It's like all the other people are putting their monsters in space. Well, we'll give Michael Myers virtual reality. They did it on an episode of Murder, She Wrote. So, I mean, it was a thing for a while. In many ways, you could argue that that's what Halloween 8 was ultimately about, with the whole audience participation of guiding a person through a house through all the reality TV cameras. Not really, but... (laughs) Because it was very much like playing a character in a game. Yeah, yeah. If you want to get obtuse about it and actually find something to be interesting about Halloween 8, there was that. Yeah, I will grant you that. (laughs) So it's like, hey, maybe the Akkads just never fully let go of that idea. I like that he's kind of a schlub. He's openly protesting Halloween. Nobody listens to him. Nobody gives a shit. He literally lives in a rented out garage. I believe it is Sabrina's garage. Yes, I believe so. So he's stuck having to deal with her on a regular basis. She delights in mocking him. I love that he's always just stuck puttering around town on this little moped. (laughs) Yeah. He is such a loser. He's the guy who's right, but nobody gives a shit because just look at him. He's the epitome of that type of character. And it makes sense, like you said, as far as like him becoming this Loomis-esque character because he was affected and haunted by Michael as a kid and just was never able to let go of that much in the way that Loomis was never able to really ever move past Michael. Even when he was in the asylum, he was never able to cure him and so therefore was never able to put that ghost to rest. And yeah, it makes a certain amount of sense to have him carry on that legacy. If you were to carry on Tommy for subsequent films, you could still have that Loomis quality of like, he shows up, he's right that Michael Myers is back, but he always shows up like every month saying Michael Myers is back. So it's that kind of boy who cried wolf type thing. It's like, he's always constantly saying he's back, he's going to kill us all. It's like, well, nothing happened. And then like the (laughs) time when it actually happens, that's not really going to change the fact that he's the guy who's always telling you disaster is coming, even when it's not coming. So people don't listen to him. (laughs) Yeah. I can totally see that sense of aging exasperation where they were to have like Halloween 12 and it's still Tommy. Mm Mm-hmm. Especially at this time. Oh, imagine a whole franchise of ageless Paul Rudd versus Michael Myers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They probably knew that they couldn't keep using Loomis. I mean, the actor had health problems. Yeah. And, but yeah, we can see how him continuing on that role would have been a really good idea to have somebody to be able to pass that torch to. Yeah, and again, like something that echoes back into the legacy of the series, too. Mm-hmm. Where unlike Tommy of the Friday the 13th, where they just kind of had to build that legacy into the character mm-hmm. as he developed this one, it's a great callback while also instantly setting up a character that you could build a chunk of the franchise on. Though now I'm just picturing Paul Rudd just yelling evil, and I'm not sure if that would work. But I still want to see that. <laughs> he would just kind of smartly say, it's evil, of course. <laughs> <laughs> while he's trying to eat a taco, and then it explodes. It's like the sheriff is like, Tommy, we gotta track you down. Michael Myers is back in town, and he's killing kids. Well, of course he is. He's evil. Don't you know anything? <laughs> God. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Paul Rudd is a gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. It is kind of a shame that they never really kept on with a Tommy character beyond part six. I mean, the franchise never really kept on with that arc beyond part six. Yeah. Oh, man. Imagine if they could get Paul Rudd back in the new Halloween movies. I was just thinking that. Paul Rudd and Jamie Lee Curtis together at last. <laughs> the streams have been crossed. Yeah. Yeah. That would just confuse people all. And I would just delight in the... He overlaps enough with the Danny Mc bride circle of creators. Yeah, I was going to say, like, there's a possibility. I mean, yeah. I have a strong feeling that they might just go back to Tommy in the new films anyways, so we'll see. Ooh. I mean, it may not be Paul Rudd, but... Ooh. What if they did a play on The Stranger, where it's a Halloween film setting up this guy with cowboy boots and a duster, and then he turns around and it's Paul Rudd with a gigantic handlebar mustache, and he's doing a spoof of Quint from Jaws where he came to hunt the monster. <laughs> Uh, you need to write to uh, Danny McBride right away and tell him to do this. And his last name is Ye Fair Spanish Ladies, and his first name is Farewell and Adieu. <laughs> his name is legally Farewell and Adieu, Ye Fair Spanish Ladies. <laughs> okay. And someone is like, it's Fair Spanish Maidens, you idiot. And he's like, damn it, I already did the paperwork. It's ladies now. <laughs> Uh, it's so easy to see Paul Rudd doing that. I know, right? 
so yeah, what did you think about? Oh yeah, they're bringing back the mysterious stranger. Well, should we bring up the mysterious stranger now, or save it till we get to the end? Yeah, I was gonna say I don't have much to say about him, anyways. Yeah, let's just go ahead and say that the mysterious stranger literally pops up. Yeah, he exists, but it's like they still have no explanation for him, so they're just kind of like, we'll just keep that plate spinning and let the next person do it. <laughs> yeah, I would rather that than the whole. Oh, it was the wily preacher from Halloween Four. Yeah, I don't. <sighs> I don't know. Or the Cult of the Thorn thing. Yeah. That's one of those things where, because there was no clear plan as to what they were going to do with it, whatever plans they come up with is going to disappoint you, most likely, yeah. because there's nothing that's going to live up to explaining what his plots are and why it yeah. ties to Michael and all this stuff. It's weird that they're carrying on that thing of where he's almost the Blofeld. He's the mastermind, seemingly, where he's the one who brings Michael into this story, and he's the one who takes Michael out of it at the end. And it is actually falling into that Cult of the Thorn thing where he's using Michael as his tool. Mm. Mm -hmm. They never explain anything about it, but it's like he's the one who initiates Michael and recovers Michael once everything's gone down. I don't like that because I don't like anything that takes away the focus of Michael being the main villain, which was also my problem with the producer's cut of Curse of Michael Myers, where he was just a tool of this cult. He is literally just a robot that they unleash to do their yeah. thing. That was one of the things I was glad they fixed in the theatrical cut, even though it was still nonsensical, but at least they got that right. What do you think about Michael in this one? And I was kind of looking through, like, I couldn't even remember what any of the kills were. So I was skimming through the script. So we have the opening where he kills the orderlies. Yeah. Then we have the bit where he catches up with the carjacker at the gas station where he steals the car. Mm -hmm. Then there's the bit where Sabrina's fucking a guy in the projection room and he's killed someone at the desk underneath the projector. Tina with the bad nose job. Was that her? I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I remember because they made a point of her bad nose job again. It's the only part not covered in blood. Yeah. And then there was the whole him chasing Dana throughout the school where she like goes and crawls through a grimy tunnel under the school and is being chased all over before running into her dad. So it's like, those were the big scares of the first 30 pages. Yeah. Did any of them have any impact on you at all? I kind of laughed at the orderly's death because he takes his IV pole and like skewers both of them through the mouth. Yeah. That seemed like that would be hard to do. Go through the back of one head and the front of another. Yeah. He kebobbed them. Yeah. I like a little bit of Supernatural Michael. I don't like him being... He's Terminator Michael. Yeah, I don't like that. That's a trait I associate more with Jason or somebody like that. I like him being just a really strong human. And probably impossibly strong for considering his build, but not unreasonably, like, impossibly strong for any human. Like, within human limits. They are kind of peeling back from Halloween 5. One of the few things that it did well was they did go back to the slightly more human Michael. But they're definitely back in the territory of Halloween 4, where he was this giant lumbering stuntman who would literally just peel people's faces apart. Yeah, I've never liked that. Remember that one time where he killed a guy by literally just shoving his thumb into a guy's head? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is definitely, they're going back to that Michael. There's a lot of aspects of Halloween 4 that I enjoy. While I actually like a lot of the gore effects, I still don't like making Michael this just ridiculously strong... That was like an early taste of the Tyler Main Michael, where he's just this yeah. gigantic, brutish wave of death who will literally just tear you apart. And even here, he's literally like pulling people to pieces. Yeah, yeah. With his bare hands. And it's like, that's not interesting. No. That's not Michael, and that's not interesting. It goes back to the, that cartoonish feeling you keep talking about. Yeah. A lot of the deaths that do happen are very much over the top. No way that any normal human could do this type of stuff. And that's fine for certain types of films, but I just don't like that in my Halloween. And they have the same type of stuff where it's like Dana's looking around and sees him down the street, or is being followed by him through the school, but none of it's really suspenseful. None of it's eerie. It's all just, hey, Michael's standing there. That's what Michael does, right? Yeah. I kind of like that. I mean, that's one of my favorite parts of the first Halloween, is all the slow build-up and tension. But there was suspense to it, and this is not doing yeah. the build-up and tension. It just has the iconography, but there's none of the heart to it. Yeah, it's like, oh, hey, and Michael's standing there and staring. And then the whole Dana having to crawl through the slimy sewer pit underneath the school for no reason. Yeah. It's like Sabrina's fucking another guy in the projection room showing a terrible car crashes video from a driving instructor. And then they don't know that, oh, another person's dead in the back of the room and nothing ever happens. Or the carjacking. We never even see what happens to the carjacker or the person getting carjacked. It's just, she's being carjacked, the guy gets behind the wheel, Michael's fist comes through the window, cut to Michael driving a car. Yeah. Again, there's no suspense to how any of this builds up. 
No, it's not well done. No. Oh, we did forget one of the best murders that you didn't mention. Roseanne going crazy and killing Tom Arnold in a news clip that opens up early on in the script. It's like between this and Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. What was with Roseanne and Tom Arnold being in all the slash movies? Yeah, again, it goes back to that cartoonish thing, but it actually got a genuine laugh out of me. So I guess points to them. Yeah, there's like several bits where there's like a news segment on TV and it's like just this complete tongue-in-cheek parody news segment. It's like something out of RoboCop. Yeah. Without any of the actual social intelligence or wit of RoboCop, but yes. No. <laughs> but that was amusingly out of nowhere. Yeah, that did get a genuine laugh, so I, I gotta give him points for that. Yeah. These are definitely cartoon writers. Yeah. These are not slasher film writers. They feel so out of their element in writing a Halloween sequel. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to think of anything else from this first segment, or should we just go ahead and move on to the next? One. Let's move on. Okay. As the story plays out, Dana begins to bond with Johnny while researching the history of Michael in her home. Sabrina and her warriors are launching a conspiracy involving Tommy, a cage, and a giant party. Michael is quietly punching through doors and stalking Dana as he picks off some people on the side, and Tommy tracks down a retired Dr. Loomis and fills him in on the return of danger now that Halloween has been reinstated and there's a new family in the Myers house. Using blueprints of the house and his virtual reality system, as well as finally winning the trust of Dana, they realize that Michael's wave of killing is a result of his home being built over a mouth to hell, a hell mouth, if you will. And if they can push Michael into the portal before midnight on Halloween, they'll be able to seal him away forever. The portal is, of course, in Dana's bedroom closet. So let's just digest that chunk. Yeah. So. So the origin of Michael. There's a portal in the bedroom closet. (laughs) Yeah. He's the kid from Poltergeist. Yeah. I mean, and that's about as much of the origin of Michael Myers that we actually get. I mean, there's really no more. No, there's no backstory. That's disappointing. I mean, I liked it better than the whole Celtic King thing that was going on in the other 666 script. Yeah. But only barely because this seems so underdeveloped. Maybe somebody else could later, if they were to make a sequel to this, could maybe turn it around and make something interesting out of it. Remember the comic where he was stillborn on a Halloween night and then came back to life on the Day of the Dead? Yeah, (laughs) I try to forget that. I don't like having an origin for Michael, so to be honest, that's one reason why I like this version just a little bit more, because at least it's vague. Kid in the suburbs who went bad. That's all you need. (laughs) Yeah. But if you have to have one, this is better, but that's really splitting hairs here. Like, it's not good. Yeah. It's a bad reason to have Michael go bad. The fact that it's a portal to hell is just ridiculous, and there's no real reason for it other than the cornerstone of the house was put there on Halloween Day, and that's like... Really? Yeah. That's just nonsensical. It doesn't work. And there's no real story to Michael Myers. There's no real story to the death of his sister or what happened to him. It's like even when Dana is researching it through all these old newspaper articles, it's all just about, hey, this murder happened and then Tommy was sad. That's all the information we get from those articles. Yeah. And then apparently the Nintendo Virtual Boy, the way that that works is you can scan in the blueprints of a house and it'll create a perfect three-dimensional reconstruction of the finished home yeah (laughs) and and then if you wander into that 3d reconstruction of the original blueprints you'll be able to locate where the portal to hell is in the real home yeah they're not even trying here this is just Mm. bullshit no this is somebody who had got told we need to have virtual reality be a thing make it work they pulled it so far out of their ass that all they got was a handful of bullshit yeah exactly like it's nonsensical it doesn't work and it's clearly like these guys have no understanding of what virtual reality is or how computers work or anything like that i mean in the 90s that wasn't terribly unusual but it's still really dumb they could get the guy who wrote hackers to do a sequel to carry but they couldn't get him to do a sequel to halloween (laughs) exactly he would have probably done a lot better job halloween hackers i kind of want to see that crossover Mm Mm-hmm. hack the planet serial killer is a whole new meaning now (laughs) Ooh, ooh! just a hacker community slasher film that's just called hack See, now you need to say that idea. I know there's hack slash, but I'm saying hack. (laughs) Yeah, no, you need to say that idea and write that out of the script. Thankfully, I didn't mention it in a public forum where anyone can hear it and steal it from me. Or you could edit it out. At least give me an associate producer credit. (laughs) Totally fine with a symbolic title. Obviously, since it was in the last script and it's in the script, it obviously had to be something that the producers were insisting on. 
neither script had any idea what to actually do with it. It's like, you want us to do virtual reality with Michael Myers? And nobody knew how, so it obviously feels like it was just kind of forced in because it needed to be. Right. But it's combining several factors that don't work. First of all, computers don't work that way. The virtual reality is nonsense. And all of this stems from the fact that there was a portal to hell in Michael Myers' childhood bedroom. Which, if you scan it, you can find it in the virtual reality world. Well, first of all, your entire thrust of the plot is now we need to push Michael Myers into a portal from his childhood bedroom. And second of all, we discover this portal through a virtual reality program. The script is just... First of all, the script never had me. Second of all, they've even lost me further. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I've gone from wanting to give the script a fair shake to... No, you're never going to win me over. It's kind of like the pumpkin patch sequence in Halloween 4, where it's just kind of like, no, I see where you're going with this now, and I'm not going there with you. Right. What I love is when we get to, like, Halloween, the curse of Michael Myers, it's like Tommy still has his computer program, but it's so devolved from the virtual reality concept, too. He just has some Cult of the Thorn pictograms on a computer screen. That's it. Yeah, (laughs) which I think is probably somebody saying, like, we can have some computer animation because we hired some sort of computer animation team or something, but... Yeah, this isn't working. Let's just rip it out. We're not going to put a full virtual reality sequence into this film. Yeah. Somebody put their foot down and said no. I love how they're like, and it's like they're walking through the set of her actual room with some shimmery effects laid over. And it's like, oh, you were literally just going to walk around the same set with shimmery effects laid over. Yeah. (laughs) It reminds me of like when they would do like virtual reality episodes of TV where they clearly couldn't afford to have like actual animation. Ooh, remember VR5? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Or they just would put, like, some sort of filter over the camera and they would just make it look pixelated. Yeah. This just doesn't work. It makes it look ugly and dumb. Yeah. It was a bad idea and they executed it badly and shame on them for trying. <laughs> And then also, in the last script we had, Tommy went to see Dr. Loomis, and Dr. Loomis was institutionalized and just kind of gave him like a little passing of the torch scene of, now I pass this on to you, you have to go save everyone. In this one, Loomis comes back, and I love how it's like Loomis is playing with the virtual reality gear. My favorite line is Tommy saying, and this is the world where I find my answers. (laughs) And Loomis doesn't just laugh and walk away. He actually goes along with it. And Loomis is just tagging along, not really doing shit. No. He's just there for Tommy to bounce stuff off of. And Loomis is like, yeah, sure, whatever. (laughs) Sounds good to me. Yeah. I suspect they at least toyed with the idea of having Loomis in the virtual reality gear. Because it seems like he's curious about it. And uh, I bet you it probably never made it to the script. But I bet you that they at one point at least toyed with the idea of having Donald Pleasance and all this stuff and going. This reality is a lie. (laughs) (laughs) It's not real. (laughs) Thank you. That has made the podcast worthwhile. I'm locked in another world. (laughs) Evil. <laughs> it's been a while since I've gone full Loomis. I've dropped the evils in there, but it's yeah. always nice to go home. I, it, it's big, you just got to get that rise of I. <laughs> it's kind of like Adam West. The way you do Adam West is you just go really high and then really low. As we go down into this castle, you know. <laughs> Fear not, true believers. Chum. Oh, yeah. And then every time you say chum, it's kind of like it's slightly pained, but joyously. Chum. <laughs> Anyways, we've devolved. (laughs) It's more fun than the script. It's like, hey, Loomis decked out in VR gear. I would pay money to see that. I wouldn't enjoy the movie, but I'd pay money to see that. Oh, yeah. Like a dying alcoholic Donald (laughs) Pleasance in his last film decked out in VR gear would be sad in so many ways, and I would still want to see it. And you know it would be like real VR gear. It would probably just be like oven mitts with some wires on it and like ski goggles with a couple like wires and stuff. Nothing that would take more than 15 minutes to put on because he would complain. Yeah. It'd be very basic and like, I have to pee. (laughs) <laughs> he wouldn't be wearing like a form-fitting suit or anything like that. He'd just be in his regular trench coat. He's like, tied on my thighs, the devil's thighs. <laughs> Blackest thighs. That was too oh. far. <laughs> or not far enough. Oh. Anyways. Yeah, and then we'll get back to Sabrina when we actually get into the whole party thing. Yeah. Some of the other scares that we have are just like, you know, Dana finds out there's bloody handprints on her wall underneath the peeling wallpaper. Yeah. Well, if the wallpaper's already peeling, her dad is not doing a very good job of restoring that house in the first place. (laughs) (laughs) It's magic. Yeah. 
Really, the only thing of consequence to really discuss in this is, oh, hey, this is what they're actually using the VR for. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, there's like her and Johnny, her and Tommy. I kind of like that Tommy keeps trying to contact her to warn her to get out of the house, and she's just kind of like, who is this crazy stalker person? Which, to be fair... (laughs) He is. Yeah. (laughs) The way he's acting is not a great way to approach somebody. It's amusing because he is such a loser, but he means well. Mm -hmm. But also that she's just kind of like, dude, what the fuck? Yeah. But then they eventually get her to the point where, yeah, by the way, the crazy soccer guy wants you to come home with him into his garage with an elderly man who wants you to put on VR gear and walk around your house. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, creepy soccer guy has a complete virtual reality recreation of your house. Yeah. (laughs) I would be calling the police. <laughs> <laughs> this script, my biggest complaint with it is you can just feel how little they give a shit as they're mm-hmm. writing this. It reads like a couple of film school guys just got their first big gig and it's like the studio offered them to write this script as a pitch. And it's like they, first of all, had no idea what to do with it. And second of all, didn't care. Yeah. This is bad. This is just a bad script. It is. It really is. I mean, I don't like Curse of Michael Myers, but I'll give it points that Dennis Ferrans actually felt like he was really passionate about that backstory. Right untalented writer. But, and he made it an actual yeah. Halloween film. Yeah. He could feel like his heart was in it. This one, there's no heart in the script. Yeah. The only heart they have is for Sabrina and that's just because she's so wildly over the top. Yeah, they're having fun writing her horribleness, but that's about the best you can say. And about the only thing I can say is that, hey, it's like unlike Halloween 4 where the teens are actually conspiring to set up something, they actually do pull it off at the end. True. <laughs> so, ready to get to the third and final segment? Sure. Everything is interrupted by Sabrina's coven, who kidnap Tommy and lock him in a cage where he's stoned by a crowd with plastic pet rocks as the centerpiece of her massive Halloween party. A rapidly evolving orgy of weed, sex, and everything Sabrina desires. Into this comes Michael, who just slaughters everybody, leaving a house filled with dead naked teenagers. With Tommy and Loomis tossed aside and the town sheriff killed, Dana is on her own, running home with Michael in pursuit, as he chases her around the house and a clock on the mantel approaches the stroke of midnight. Dana finally shoves Michael into the portal with a go to hell, fucker, and he finds himself clawed into the other realm by a mixture of demons and all of his past victims. As the special effects fade away and police arrive on the scene, Dana is comforted by Tommy and Loomis and tells her father that everything will be alright. Loomis enters the house and looks around. Checking the clock on the mantel, he's devastated to see that it's five minutes slow and that Michael was pushed into the portal after midnight. Cut to outside of the house as the unconscious body of Michael Myers is dragged away by the mysterious stranger in cowboy boots. The end. Thank God. So, Sabrina's party. We did skip over one kind of important death. The death at the cage. Yeah, go for the death at the cage. That was another example of just like how ridiculously over the top this script is, where he pushes her against the bars of the cage so much that her torso falls through the space yeah. between the bars, but her arms don't. So her arms get violently ripped off. Well, and they did that in the theatrical cut of Halloween 6 has an orderly that gets up to a fence and Michael just squishes the guy through the fence. Yeah. I don't know. The way that it was described in the script, I just do not no. buy that. And admittedly, like, for one thing, if the bars are that thin, then why can't Tommy get out of it? Because I would think that they're going to cast an actor who at least could then squeeze through those bars if her whole torso is wide enough to fit through it. That was when I was just like, oh, they're not going to get any more serious with this. This is like the peak of, oh, this is just badly written horror. Like, it's just gore for gore's sake. And not only that, but then the body disappears later on, so that way there's no evidence. And like, her arms got ripped off. How the hell is there not blood all over the place? I can't imagine Michael Myers just coming in with like squeegee and, yeah. you know, <laughs> and some like ammonia. And, he brought the hose over. Yeah, he's just like... <laughs> You know, as he's spraying it down. He has the hair of his mask in a, in a little hairnet. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Ooh, ooh. I just thought of a parody where a slasher film killer is wearing the outfit and a white style Michael Myers mask of Alice from the Brady Bunch. <laughs> and it's all about a killer who does these really elaborate deaths and then cleans up after. I think you could probably do something with that. You know, that bulky blue outfit with the dress and the apron, and then mm-hmm. that face and that hair up in a hairnet, get her some of the big rubber gloves and a vacuum and her bucket of cleaning supplies. And she takes home the corpses to Sam the Butcher. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, my God. An entire slasher film parody themed around 70s sitcoms. I Yeah. And your Loomis character is Archie Bunker. 
<laughs> oh, jeez, Edith. Look at the... Oh, this is... Oh. Because nobody ever listens to me. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> now, this is one I need to explore. That would be an interesting spin on Alice, sweet Alice. Yeah. I can see, like, the robot chicken guys, like, doing something like that. <laughs> it's Michael Myers, but it's Alice from the Brady Bunch. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I want that now. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to have to talk to some people, see what we can do. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, and then I kind of like that there is this mystery about how they keep talking about their plans for the night, and they keep talking about this cage. You see them building this cage. And then it is actually an effective scene where they kidnap Tommy, but it's literally just the two jocks literally burst into Tommy's house, deck Loomis, and pull him out of his own home. And it's like, guys could have, like, set up more of an elaborate, like, actual trap or something like that. Yeah, you think that they could, like, lure him out? I thought they were just going to build the cage, like, right up against his house so he would walk right into it. <laughs> <laughs> and then they would, like, slam it shut behind. Yeah. But then they're going to stone him with plastic My Pet Rocks. That is so absurd, I kind of love it. And by the way, pet rocks were a real thing, and they were actually rocks. They were just yes. smooth stones. They were not ever plastic. No, but I kind of love the idea of stoning someone with cheap plastic rocks. Yeah. It's a symbolic humiliation. Because I was really how over the top are they going to take Sabrina? Yeah, it's like, are they going to go, like, full the trial and just, like, actually kill him? It made me worried that, like, they were actually going to have her actually try to kill Tommy. I'm glad they didn't go that far, but it's still ridiculous. It is. Why does she care about this guy? Like, he keeps to himself. And immediately, I'm trying to look at it from the perspective of a guy who's almost 40, as opposed to a teenage girl. I'm sure there are people who've done stuff similar to that, but it just leave the poor Tommy alone. Yeah. My biggest thing is when I saw that, I'm like, oh, I think I see where they're going, where this is something that's being set up for Sabrina to use against Tommy, but then our heroes are going to use it to capture Michael at some point. Nope. Nope. And then just the whole orgiastic party where it's like they're talking about and all the teens are like shirtless and down to their panties and people are having sex and smoking weed. And it's just like this gigantic free for all that worked well in Cherry Falls. And then Michael comes in and is just killing every fuck. It's like this entire town is losing an entire generation of their teenagers. Yeah. In this gigantic sex party, because Michael just goes in and slaughters every fucking person. Mm -hmm. And it's like he's killing the one guy by, like, connecting the hose of the beer keg to him and inflating him with beer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, like, Sabrina goes out so simply where it's just he stabs her through the mouth and that's it. I wanted Sabrina to, like, actually be like, fucker, you're ruining my party and, like, take him on. I wanted her to go all Busta Rhymes on him. I would have liked that. I would prefer that to Busta Rhymes. She does die because she insisted on grabbing her wooden clogs because she's going to a 70s theme party. Oh, God. Were clogs a thing in the 70s? Why aren't they doing platform shoes? Yeah, exactly. I didn't understand that. Cool. Have her spin kicking the slasher killer while wearing wooden clogs so they keep clonking right into his face. Do that for a few spins. Yeah, like one of her boyfriends is saying, like, we gotta get out of here. We gotta get out of here. She's like, I'm not leaving without my clogs in. And he's like, we gotta leave. And she's like, Derek. And then as she does escape out the door, but she trips on her clogs and that's what ends up getting her killed. Yeah. Sabrina is such a wildly over-the-top character that's like, you need to have her go out in just as over-the-top of a fashion. Right. She's literally the leader of the cult of teenagers that populates this town. You have to slaughter her in something. Like, to the point where she literally gathers an entire crowd to stone someone who meets her disapproval. Yeah. You gotta play up to that and give her something that's worthy of that stature. Yeah. I mean, I get it that they're trying to play, like, oh, her own inability to, like, go of her own stuff. No, I get that, but it's still the wrong way to go. Yeah, exactly. It's not well done, even if that was the route they wanted to go, because it, A, it doesn't fit that character, and yeah. B, it's so underwhelming. Compared to, like you said, we had just gotten somebody getting death by beer keg. Yeah. This is so underwhelming yeah. as far as a good memorable death to, like, one of the only characters who actually is worth talking about in the script. Yeah, it's disappointing. It actually made me think back to the previous Halloween 6 script where, again, I actually really like chunks of that draft. Mm -hmm. And one of the chunks that I really enjoyed was the gigantic party of teenagers where Michael Myers infiltrates the party and is just walking around. He's not killing everybody. He's just walking around the party trying to figure out how he can get up to the room where Tommy is all locked in with the lead woman of that version. 
I like that whole Michael just hanging out with the teenagers and they don't suspect that he has anything to do with them until he gets to the point where he's literally like flinging the lovers out of the bathroom so he can start digging up through the ceiling to get up into the attic. Right. On the one hand, I really liked how all that played out. And on the other hand, I love the setup of just how wild of a party this is. Is there any way we could like merge the two? Like have Sabrina and her whole cultish orgy and kind of merge it with Michael just kind of wandering in and just being like, fuck it, I don't give a shit. I just want those people over there. Because they decided to go with the whole 70s theme party. It didn't quite work because A, it doesn't really have anything to say about the 70s. So it doesn't really add anything other than just to have a theme party. If it was something like a more modern day party, because I mean, they play with that to a degree. Like there's a guy who's dressed up like Michael. and He's like, hey, you're like me. And then he gets stabbed because he's got like a real butcher knife. And so Michael just grabs it from him and stabs him with it. That was almost bordering on clever. What if it was a party where everyone had to wear a Michael Myers mask? Yeah, I was going to say, like, or at least there's like a whole bunch of them. And that way you have the main characters. Maybe they're trying to get out unnoticed and they don't know who is the real Michael. And Michael is also confused by all this. He does great head tilts and stuff like that. Right. Well, it's like these obnoxious teenagers are celebrating the return of Halloween by using the iconography of the person who got it banned in the first place. You just have everybody be like, the theme is Michael Myers. So everyone has the same mask, but then everyone one's playing with the outfits where it's like you got your big fat Michael, you got your short skinny Michael, you got your Michael in booty shorts, you got your Michael in a bikini, you got your sexy Santa Michael. You know, it's like everyone just kind of doing their own variation on the outfit, but they all are wearing the exact same mask. Or, or some people dress up like that, but some people dress up like Michael's victims and you could have like flashbacks, him like stabbing random person from like Halloween's one through five. My issue is I don't think that's something that would really affect Michael. I don't know. I could kind of see him like doing that great head tilt that he can do sometimes. And like, I killed you already. Oh, someone dressed like Laurie in the original film. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Something like that, where you could just have that reaction and just take it out on this innocent party goer or something like that. That could be interesting. A party goer who's dressed up as Dr. Loomis. I've got pie. Who wants pie? (laughs) Oh, (laughs) I'm trying to get hammered tonight. (laughs) The devil's pies? I'm getting laid! (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it's sad that our dumb ideas are better than the actual ideas in this script. You know, if these cartoony comedy guys wanted to just make this a cartoony comedy, I would probably enjoy it more than them trying to play it straight and not succeeding. Yeah, exactly. So one thing I also haven't mentioned is bringing up that whole idea of Halloween was banned for a long time. Yeah, we've seen so many times. Halloween 4 did that, the earlier draft of Halloween 6 did that, the finished film of Halloween 6 did that, because remember, they are having that radio host who was hosting the big party in the park. Again, that's an interesting concept. I prefer the idea of that now being lifted and the teenagers celebrating with a giant party to the Halloween 4 of let's all go to the drive-in the next town over. Yeah. I still want more of that. That's what I also liked about the previous draft of Halloween 6, where it was the journalist coming to Haddonfield and interviewing all these people about what they think about this lift of the ban on Halloween. You got all the people who are excited about it, people who are scared about it, people who are like, yeah, my kid was killed by Michael Myers. I'm pissed at this. They got into some of the broader stuff. I'd like to expand on that a little more, but I think the earlier draft of Halloween 6 was the best one to actually touch on that idea. Yeah, because this just seems like it addresses it to a degree, like they're kind of letting loose and all that, but it basically just ends up being the excuse for an orgy, which really doesn't play a huge part in the actual story other than just being an excuse for them to pick on Tommy. And I will say, if you want to see that full-on orgy thing done well, I do recommend the slasher film Cherry Falls. That was a really bold one starring Brittany Murphy, where it was a slasher is killing virgins, so the parents arrange a gigantic orgy for all of their teenagers to lose their virginity. (laughs) And the killer just starts slashing through. It's a film that has its problems, but the kills are great, and my god, the satire of it, of the killer's going to kill you until you get laid, so everybody best get laid right now. (laughs) And the way they play the killer then violently cutting through that party is incredibly well done and entertaining, too. And it's a film that's worth checking out. Hmm. Okay, so if we were to boil down Halloween 6, something involving the Myers home, new people are living there, the town has banned Halloween for a good decade now and is finally reinstating it, the new populace of teenagers looks at this as a great opportunity to finally cut loose with a gigantic party, Tommy is the person who still remembers that horror and is kind of representing all the people who are like, that's not a good idea because he's still out there. Mm -hmm. And of course, it turns out that Michael is still out there and comes back and reminds everyone why Halloween was banned to begin with. 
that has enough of a story that you can build a good Halloween 6 out of. Yeah. It's shocking that in the three attempts to do that, they've had such a hard time doing so. Yeah. There's definitely potential. I think it's part of it is the writers that they've got were not that great. Yeah. I mean, Phil Rosenberg, who did the last draft, never went on to do anything else that I was able to find. And then these two guys have obviously gone on to have careers, one of them more successfully than the other. And then Dennis Ferrans did actually go on to have a career pretty decently after that, too. But it's like all three of them were just writers coming out of film school or were just like doing pitches to the studio instead of the studio actually getting someone who knew what they were doing. Right. So I wonder if it was just a matter of they'll work for cheap. Dimension was just looking for cheap talent fresh out of film school. Yeah. Which a lot of their franchise sequels have been done by. Which I kind of get. Like, it's something where you're not going to get Michael Chabon or something like that to come in and punch up your Halloween 6 script. Though imagine if they had. Oh, I mean, trust me. I think that (laughs) he might have fun doing that. He's a big nerd. But the fact is that, and I'm not saying that they're necessarily bad writers, but like you said, they're right out of film school. This is probably like one of the first scripts that they ever sold, but I just don't think that they had the experience, at least at that time, to do it. Yeah, and that both the earlier draft and this draft, it ultimately comes down to, we need to push Michael through a portal to hell before Halloween. Oops, our clocks were broken, we were too late. Yeah. Just get rid of that. Get rid of that entire plot altogether. And to be fair, it's like, how do you end that story? Easy. Michael came back and reminded everyone to fear Halloween. That's literally the note you want to end it on. You drive him away for another year, but he'll be back next year. Mm -hmm. That should be the entire theme of the movie. There's a reason why you fear Halloween. Right. And I think you could do that effectively. Like, it's November 1st, 6 a.m. He just disappears. And people look go on the manhunt and they don't find him. Exactly. Like the first film. You had this whole thing. He got knocked out of the house and looks down on the ground. He's gone. Yeah. He's just gone. He'll be back next Halloween. Mm -hmm. Or in part two, he'll be back in like five minutes, you know? (laughs) I mean, yeah, that should be. He's the boogeyman. He is the specter that comes out every Halloween to remind you that there are things to fear on Halloween, while also kind of having this, again, there's this mischievous quality to him that not enough of the films capture. Because they keep trying to go as either the deranged serial killer or the murder golem. And no, he is like Pan, a much quieter, more introverted version of Pan, the figure of mischief who comes out on this season to remind you what the season is about. It's about fear. Mm -hmm. And he will make you fear it. And yes, it is tied to this person who has this backstory. And you can't forget that. It doesn't make Michael stop being Michael Myers. But the shape is something that he also represents. Michael Myers in the shape, it's not that one is in the shadow of the other. They are both the thing. He is the character that was necessary to become the representation of that for this generation. Mm -hmm. If we want to get full on mythological, and that's a way that you can, again, toe the line of supernatural without actually making it supernatural. Yeah. And yeah, just have it be like, again, this entire town is building this whole tension and frenzy about Halloween with the people who love it and the people who are terrified of should we is this a good idea to bring it back and his whole reason is to sweep in and say no you shouldn't have brought it back but you're stuck with it you can't make halloween go away you can't make me go away you're just gonna have to deal with us each year right and they kind of touch upon that where the town had banned halloween and it wasn't until that ban was lifted that the stranger brings back michael now i don't like that aspect but it seems to me like they're trying to tie that into his story where he comes out when halloween happens even though by this point he should have had several years of films that we didn't apparently see. Oh, but he was being kept comatose by The Stranger. Yeah, I... Uh... Yeah. And to be fair, that's because they had Halloween 6 planned to come out the year after Halloween 5, which is why they set up that cliffhanger. But then we had years where it fell into a whole legal battle over the rights. Mm-hmm. And Halloween 6 was the first of the Miramax movies because they finally got the rights from that. Yeah. There's enough stuff there to work with. There's no reason why all three of these had to be as bad. I, I think also part of it was the studio insisting on the virtual reality element, which I'm glad they finally dropped. I mean, again, it's like that previous draft, the Phil Rosenberg draft. It's like 60, 70 percent of that script. I would be perfectly fine just keeping as is. Yeah. You get rid of the portal to hell ending. You get rid of the virtual reality bullshit. That gives you enough room. You can just keep building on what else is there. And I would have been perfectly happy had we done that. Had we just taken that draft and built on it. This script is just throw this instantly in the shredder. This has no business being here. This is a completely uninspired, uninvested, has no idea what it's doing, doesn't really give a shit to even try. This is just a waste of a script Mm -hmm. and then Halloween the curse of Michael Myers I get that he put a lot of heart into that whole mythos that he built I kind of like the character of the single mother who returns to town her relationship with Tommy I like that they instead of the whole portal to hell they do try to return it around to 
this happened to one kid. What if it happened to another kid? What if it happened to your kid? Mm -hmm. That the ending of Halloween 4 almost started to touch on. And that's still something that, again, if you're doing a whole town that hasn't had Halloween for years and suddenly this new generation gets to have Halloween, well, what if you start touching upon, well, who's going to be the next generation of Michael? Michael comes in, but what if there's going to be a new kid who becomes the next Michael, you know? And not even so much the next Michael, but who's going to be the next kid who just one day, seemingly perfect kid in a seemingly perfect home, just one day, it goes wrong. And they suddenly just become this little monster thing. There's so much potential there to chew into if you just bring in some really clever writers. Right. I could see that still folding into the whole generational aspect of we haven't had Halloween here for 10 years. The new generation of teenagers wants to have their new generation of Halloween. There's ways in which you could take all the elements that all three of these drafts are playing with and do something with them. Except for the virtual reality. Except for the virtual reality and the portal to hell. Yeah. And I'm glad the curse of Michael Myers dropped the portal to hell. Cult of the Thorn, eh, I have my frustrations with it, but I can at least play along with it to a degree. Once you mention the portal to hell, you lost me. Yeah. Once you mention virtual reality, you lost me. <laughs> I mean, you could have, like, virtual reality be a part of the story if you just want to have it, like, as a background element. Like, oh, that's what he does. To want to show, like, how much of a loser Tommy is because he just sits and plays video games all day. And he plays virtual reality because it's the 90s and that was cool. Ooh, ooh. Haddonfield has fallen into such socioeconomic collapse that a whole new group of people have moved in and basically turned it into a new Silicon Valley. And so you literally have this whole gaming and tech suburbia. Like everyone who's there works for this giant tech center and they're developing virtual reality software and gaming. And Michael Myers comes home. And each virtual reality set has a small piece of Stonehenge inside of it. <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> Oh, God, yeah. They're going to sell their big virtual reality console that's going to cause kids' heads to explode into snakes and spiders and eat their parents. Yep, yep. You know what? If we wanted to merge Michael Myers with Season of the Witch, that's not the worst route to go. Is the new VR headsets are meant to basically just explode your children into monsters that will eat you. Yep. Even if we don't do a Halloween Season of the Witch remake using that concept, I want to use that concept. <laughs> I keep telling you, like, our dumb ideas are better than their good ideas. <laughs> but instead of inviting us to a pitch room, we just got to keep doing these podcastings. <laughs> exactly. Eventually, they got to notice us, right? Right. I mean, it's not like we actually have to do the work of writing and pitching and going around to the studios and moving to L.A. Why would anyone do that? <laughs> Surely some producer will listen to a podcast and hire us for their multi-million dollar picture. Wouldn't they? Yeah. That's how the system works, right? Especially with our great ideas like Loomis in a virtual reality gear. No. <laughs> The world is alive! <laughs> Even just elderly man in virtual reality gear, that's all you need is, oh, 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 imagine a version of grumpy old men set in the reality of Ready Player One. <laughs> It's like all the elderly senior citizens in retirement homes who that's their only escape to have some fun during the day while calling each other putts. <laughs> Ernest Klein, you are missing the opportunity to explore that aspect of your world. Where is the elderly people who just want to use virtual reality gear to ice fish again? Instead of pop culture references to like sci-fi or horror, it's like Bonanza, <laughs> Perry Mason. Anyways, back to Ready Player, back to Ready Player Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Ernest Klein's Halloween 6. Uh, to be fair, Ernest Klein would write a better Halloween 6. Ready Player 666. Mm. I mean, that's how many coins it takes to play an arcade game these days. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, let's get back. I'm trying to even think about what else is even left to discuss. What would you think about the sheriff that we kind of briefly meet? Uh, exactly. Yeah, I barely, <laughs> I think his name is Doggin or something like that. Other than the fact that I mentally cast him with a wily Bruce Dern, that's about the only interesting thing I had about <laughs> I kind of like how he was like, ah, oh, those darn kids with their pranks again. It's like every scene is that. Yeah, he has no point in the story other than just to be completely disbelieving of the actual goings on of the script. And we do have the scene where he's like emptying a gun into Michael Myers and it's not doing anything because Michael Myers is not even a person anymore by this point. Yeah. What even happened to Johnny? I don't even remember what happened to Johnny. Um, I think they were at Dana's house, and doesn't Michael kill him or something there? Does he? Because I think they were, like, looking through her old stuff, pictures of, like, her mom and stuff. Oh, and then he kills Johnny, and then she goes to get the sheriff, and then there's no body? Yeah. Out of nowhere, two hands grab him and throw him down the hall. He crashes into the far wall. da 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 da, -da. And well, then he's chasing her around. We don't actually see that he's died. He was just tossed across the room. But do we never see him again after that point? Nope. Because that's like page 60 in a 97-page script, so it's like another 30 pages go by. And he got thrown across a room, and then we never see him ever again. 
Well, he was just disposable love interest for the main character. I mean, I imagine that with Tommy, they figured they didn't need two guys. Yeah. I mean, as opposed to Loomis. But he's a disposable character and is apparently just brushed underneath. I kind of forgot about him, to be honest. And then I got nothing else. I got literally nothing else to talk about on the script. It's a bad script. And I don't say that to be mean to the writers. Like you said, some of them went on to do some good stuff. Well, and one of them did Son of the Mask. So. <laughs> I said some good stuff, not all of it. <laughs> to be fair, I really liked Cats and Dogs. And when I heard that he was doing a mask film, I'm like, oh, he would be a good fit for that. Yeah, unfortunately. I think the problem was is Jamie Kennedy in a really bad script. Yeah. But there's a couple of halfway decent ideas that, like you said, in better hands could have been fleshed out and turned into something interesting. But none of it actually works here on the page. Like, I mean, there's nothing here that is interesting. It has potential, but none of it's realized. No. But again, a lot of those were elements that were already in place in the last script, too. Yeah. Obviously, they had a general idea of what they wanted to do, and a lot of those are elements that do pop up again in the finished film, too. Mm -hmm. So it's like they had a rough idea of what they wanted for Six, and they just kept taking stabs at it until they settled on one. I'm still not a big fan of what they settled on, but I'll take it over this. Yeah. I don't like either of the three drafts, but the Phil Rosenberg one was my favorite of the three, just because I think the highs were consistently high enough that there's something there to work with, and you would only have to replace chunks of the script instead of having to start over from page one. Curse of Michael Myers is one where it has a collection of elements that don't work in how they're put together, but you would really just have to kind of pull it apart and put it back together in a different way. Mm -hmm. This one is just shit. Yeah, this is easily the worst of the three. None of them were close to being this bad, but it's not incompetently bad. It's just there's nothing here that is remotely, even entertainingly bad. As bad as, like, Halloween 4 script that we read was, that at least was interestingly bad. That was interestingly bad, yeah. This is just blandly bad. This is flat. It's paper with ink blots on it. If you were to watch this film, you would have forgotten you watched it a year later. Yeah. If not, like, the next day. It's uninspired. Right. There's nothing here that's horrible other than the virtual reality and the portal to hell. And even that's, like... Even that, it's something... If you're going to commit to that, you could do something well and interesting with it. But it's very hard. But you could pull it off. Right. And they don't... They don't even try. They're not inspired <laughs> to do anything interesting with the tools that they were given. Some of them were bad tools. Like, we would prefer not to see the virtual reality thing but there are good ideas here but they didn't use them at all yeah they just put them in and did the bare minimum and admittedly this was a first draft maybe they thought they could come back in later and fix it up again like the first draft of the phil rosenberg one was a better example of one that you could come back to and fix exactly this one is just there's nothing there Instead of, like, taking a script and continuing to build it and develop it, it felt like they were just being like, here's kind of our vague idea for a Halloween 6. Let's give it to a bunch of different writers and see what each of them independently come up with. Yeah. It's flat. It's uninspired. I would say this is better than the Halloween 4 script in that it has a legitimate beginning, middle, and end. True. But that was more interesting in just how bizarre and bonkers it was. It was not a good script at all, but it at least had chunks that you could, again, build in very interesting ways. And was touching on ideas that just were, like, really weirdly out there. Mm -hmm. And then this kind of gets into that whole frustrating thing of where Halloween 4 is a mess of a movie but does enough things right that it's still entertaining to watch. And it really set up the great character of Jamie Lloyd. And it's a shame that Jamie never really got to play out her potential. Yeah. And that Tommy was a really great concept for another new character who, again, never really got the chance to shine the way that he should have. Mm-hmm. I mean, no version of the three Halloween 6 scripts did a good job with Tommy. To be fair, I think they really shot themselves in the foot with Halloween 5 going the directions that it did, too. True. That was such a mess of a film. Halloween 5 is still my least favorite of all the Halloween movies. Yeah. Part of the problem with Halloween 6 is they have to kind of recover from Halloween 5, and there's no graceful way to do that without no. either just ignoring what came before or trying in vain to fill up an idea that no one had an idea of where they were going to go with the whole Stranger and the Cult of Thorn yeah. and all that stuff that they ended up doing. Yeah. Yeah. So we end this episode on another sad note. <laughs> sad note of many, but again, it's like these are unproduced for a reason. Yeah. It's interesting to look through. As somebody who hasn't read a whole lot of scripts, I find these kind of interesting to see, like, why I respond to some things and why I don't. But yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> what we've chosen to look at is you're finding a whole lot of things I don't respond to. Yeah. I mean, there's only really one of these unproduced scripts that I enjoyed, and that's one that we'll be getting to on a future episode. So that's going to end this episode of Genographa. 
So we'll be back again with some more Halloween goodness coming up. Yay! Good night, everybody. Go to hell, fucker. (laughs) Good night. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. <laughs>